This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by Atom Audio, Isotope, Native Instruments, Empirical Labs, Sound Porter Mastering, and Trace Audio. You're hearing my voice right now through custom Trace Audio cables and the new Empirical Labs pump compressor mixed through Isotope RX, Ozone, Neutron, Nectar, and Plasma, all mixed on Atom Audio monitors. Please check out our awesome sponsors using the links in the show notes. It's a great way to help support this show. Now get ready to rock. Give of yourself generously to the people you're working with. It's incredible what comes back from other people when you set the pace of generosity, just in terms of your ideas, your physical tools that you're offering the project, your your time, your investment. When you When you are generous, it is unbelievable what you can accomplish with, with literally anybody, really. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Adam Audio celebrates 25 years of designing industry-leading monitors in Berlin by unveiling the Arctic White A4V and A7V monitors, available for a limited time. With the XART ribbon tweeter design, customizable speaker voicings, and Sonarworks integration for room correction, these monitors deliver professional-grade sound perfect for Grammy-winning producers and home studios. Make your studio cooler than cool with the Arctic White A4V and A7V available for a limited time with the standard extended five-year warranty at adamaudio.com. At Isotope, saturation just got a whole lot smarter. Introducing the new Isotope Plasma plugin to supercharge your sound by giving your tracks exactly what they need, precisely when and where they need it. Unlike traditional saturators that apply a static effect, Plasma's groundbreaking flux saturation technology analyzes your sound and applies dynamic processing, adding targeted warmth, depth, and character to bring out the best in your mixes and masters. Use the secret code ROCK10 to get 10% off the new Plasma or any of the awesome plugins at isotope.com. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Jeremy Steckel, a musician and producer in Columbus, Ohio. Having settled into an indie pop and rock production and mixing universe, Jeremy focuses on building the landscape of the song around the core part of almost every modern song, the vocal performance. Nothing speaks louder than an emotional, well-captured vocal delivery, and the song always has to serve that objective. Some of Jeremy's credits include Meow Boys, Coastal Club, Louie, Darity, Sean Mack, Trana, Brightest London, The Orphan, The Poet, and Embleton, to name just a few. And today we're going to talk about working as a touring guitarist, building a new mixing studio, how to get great production and mixes, and even finding ways to level up your business through the power of a mastermind group. Um, I want to give a big shout out and a thank you to our mutual friend and previous podcast guest, Jim Stewart, for making our introduction. Please welcome Jeremy Steckel to Recording Studio Rockstars. Jeremy, my man, are you ready to rock, dude? I definitely am. I'm excited to be here. Good to have you here, man. Is this, um, are you joining us from your studio or your new studio that's getting built now? Yes, I am in my new studio space. And uh, it's mostly done, but uh, if you're watching this online later, you can see some painting that needs to be done and some little things. But yeah, it's it's mostly built out at this point. So, yep. That's awesome. I see you've got a nice window off to the side, too. I really like um, studios that can let some natural light into the space. Yeah. I tell everybody that comes over here, like, I'm not one of those cave dweller guys that, like, like I, I have, like, a visceral reaction to 
you know, sunlight. I like, I just have to have it, you know? So yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, have you done both lot. kinds of sessions? The ones where you're just, you have no idea what time of day it is and the ones where you see the light and the sun setting and all that? Yeah, I have. I've definitely been in studios, you know, where one of the first studios I worked in years ago, it was this beautiful custom built studio, but there were zero windows and you had to go to the lobby of the building, you know, and it, you know, on one hand, it was cool because there was really not a lot of distraction. It was kind of like, this is what we're doing today. And we're gonna, you know, but we would all just find ourselves outside every couple hours anyway. And so I, I remember thinking like, if I ever build a studio, or just even a mixing room, like I gotta have a window or something, you know, Yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's just how I how I work. So yeah, I'd, I'd say that some of the first studios I was in, um, primarily were windowless. And mm. it was the same thing. It's like you you kind of, um, well, there was something nice about the immersion in recording. That's always <laughs> good. Like I like doing a session with no distractions, um, but it was also really tempting to just take a break and go play ping pong yeah, and go outside. And there was so many beautiful spring days that would happen. Yep. Where I was like, God, what am I doing inside a closed room all day when it's a beautiful oh, day outside? I know. Well, so it's, it's funny that, that you balance. say that because the studio that I was referring to earlier that I was in that was windowless, it was in the spring. We were there for like two months. And so uh, it was, you know, 75 and sunny every day. And we were like, we paid a lot of money to be here, but like, what are we, what are we doing? <laughs> like, why didn't we do this in like January, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a similar one. The first major label record I did, we were up at Smart Studios in Madison, Wisconsin. And it was through the summer months. So it was just gorgeous. I mean, like, you know, Wisconsin and the north of the U.S., um, it's just beautiful in the summertime. Mm. And we went on to a vampire schedule. We'd show up, we'd sleep all day, like show up at the studio at four in the afternoon and go home and go to bed at nine in the morning. Oh, my gosh. I did cereal, cereal for dinner. Um, yeah. Was your experience like that? Was that uh, related to you as a touring musician? Yeah. So that, um, yeah, that studio I was talking about, that was me as a guitar player, not as a engineer or mixer or anything or producer at that point. Um, yeah, I, t I toured in a band called Wolves at the Gate for several years. I started that band um, with a couple of friends when we were in college in the middle of nowhere here in Ohio at a little private college. Um, yeah. And so we, that, that studio experience, I, I have it several times in my notes here to talk about just because it was such a like foundational moment for me of just being in a real studio. I'm sure we can all remember like the first time we did that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, definitely tell us that, you know, give us a little bit of a mm -hmm. preamble into your interest in playing guitar and getting into the recording bit, but, um, tell us about the, uh, the whole band experience. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, I guess it's a good segue. I so I uh I'm in my mid 30s and I didn't pick up a guitar until I was well into my high school years. Mm -hmm. Um which is kind of funny like going all the way back. Like I had a super strong interest in music from a like visceral emotional standpoint when I was a kid, but I didn't really I didn't grow up in a family. They didn't hate music, but it just wasn't really a uh, a part of our existence as a family to put mm -hmm. it like <laughs> in that way, I guess it just wasn't around much. So I just didn't have any way to figure out why do I like this so much or what's going on. So I didn't pick up a guitar forever. Like which, you weren't the kind of family that was singing songs in a group in the oh, living room and strumming nope. guitars on the porch. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's interesting. Cause I mean, like it's true. Some people grow up, you know, if you're one of the Carters, Mm -hmm. in, you know, Eastern Tennessee, you grew up, literally grew up strumming a guitar or whatever. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just, it was part of the DNA of so many families. And it just, we are, my, the DNA of my family was sports and, you know, church and a lot of other things that were great. And I still am involved in all of that stuff. But, you know, music was just kind of this like huge afterthought, you know? Um, so how did you sort of pivot out? How do you, how do you set off on your own interest? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. Uh, I'll answer it a couple of ways. The first way is I just my personality is I'm a self starter. And I'm very, like obsessive about things that I care about. And so on one hand, when I kind of figured out like, 
oh my gosh, these sounds I'm hearing in my head, that's actually, you can do that on an instrument, which is such a funny foundational thing to think. But when you're a kid, it's kind of this like, oh my gosh, you know? And so I had a friend give me a guitar and <laughs> when I was, you know, 14 or 15 and I just, I, I, I still have not really put it down, you know, like yeah. functionally speaking, you now, know, I, if you're holding it right now, I can't quite see it on the camera, but it's, I know it's right mean. down here. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's your locked. toe is strumming. My wife is toe. like, you got to put it down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I picked up, it was just an acoustic guitar and, uh, it was a nice guitar, which side note, I always recommend if you're starting out on an instrument as a, or if you're giving an instrument to a kid, give them a decent quality instrument. Because yeah. you probably want to play it more and longer. So this, thankfully, this guy gave me a really nice guitar to borrow. And, you know, I just would come home every day, you know, after school and just go nuts on that guitar and my, you know, just play everything I could possibly think of. And just, and, and that really bred in me an ability or a, a desire, I should say, to just write music also, because I didn't really have this catalog of music that I had listened to as a kid. You know, it's this mm -hmm. really weird scenario where I loved music, but I didn't really know music. And so when I got a guitar, it was just off to the races. I bought so much music and figured out how to play all of it. And, you know, it was just kind of this like explosion of a world opening up to me. You yeah, know? I, I agree with you about the uh, also like making sure that kids get a chance to start with a good instrument. When mm -hmm. I When my daughter wanted to play guitar and I was like, great, let's go to the store and, and, you know, see what there is. And we were at Guitar Center and I was like, what can we get you for 150 bucks? And I, <laughs> you know, we pull them off the wall and it was like, this is terrible. Like nothing. I mean, it may have changed now, but, you know, in the end it was like, all right, let's, let's move our budget up to like 500 bucks or whatever. Yes. Yes. And I don't even know where that gets you today, but it was the same thing. I just thought like, if, if it doesn't sound good, why would you want to strum it and play it and learn a chord and stuff. Cause then, exactly. cause then you try it and it just, what comes out sounds bad. And you're like, yeah, this is no fun. <laughs> and you're going to, you know, as a kid, you're going to internalize that and be like, this isn't, I'm not very good at this or, you know, and, yeah. and hopefully, you know, a lot of kids stick through that and stuff. They, they can push through, but that's just, it's a nice leg up to have a nice instrument, you know? So how did you, um, so you started doing the band thing and then did you guys, uh, start oh. to see some success as a band? Yeah. So we started, um, yeah, several years later, you know, I went to college and um, a buddy, uh, a friend of mine at school, uh, there were only a few of us at this private Christian university that really enjoyed like heavy metal or kind of hardcore rock stuff. But we were all kind of in our own sections. We didn't really know each other, but we knew of each other. It was this kind of weird, like, you know, oh, you play in bands, right? Kind of a like yeah. bumping in the hallway kind of thing. And so... Finally, one day we came to our senses and we all started hanging out and writing together. And that became Wolves at the Gate, those guys, those four guys, um, you know, which that band is still a band today. I'm I'm not touring with them any longer, but I'm very, you know, connected to them. Love those guys to death. Yeah. Um, it's funny that, that 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 was in the name because it reminds me, I used to sort of, I was introduced to CCM music, Christian contemporary music in Nashville. Never even, I never even knew it existed until I came down here really, you know. But what I saw was, would be, and, and for you to talk about like being some of the few kids who are interested in heavy metal, obviously music is a big part of the church scene because there's a message to carry. It's, it's moving, it's emotional, it becomes part of services. And then also it's a great way to get a message and a feeling and an emotion out to people, right? And I mean, yeah. I'm riffing here. You can come back and, and set me straight on this. But, um, but one of the things I noticed was that there were all these styles of music that came out of contemporary Christian music that were like, there'd be rap, there'd be rock, there'd be other things. Yep. And of course there's this saying, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing. But I always, I, my, my sort of internal joke was like, a lot of Christian music was um, sheep in wolf's clothing, you know? It's like, <laughs> yes, it's exactly. like, you know, trying to do the rock band thing to get the message across. That's yeah. right. But you're actually a sensitive, you know, uh, that, yeah, there's a spiritual side to it for sure that you don't yeah. always see right away. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's All funny right, you picked up on continue. that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, well, and just, you know, before we move on, that the church point that you made is really um, very powerful because that's how I started playing guitar in front of people. Right. For the first time. 
a church youth group. And there are so many bands and musicians and producers and mixers that I work with. And I'm just around that say, oh yeah, you know, I started, you know, I started at my church, you know, when I was 12, I picked, they, they put me on stage. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, and that's exactly how I was, you know, I picked up a guitar. I was terrible. They needed a guitar player. And I was just the personality to be like, oh yeah, I'll try it. You know, whatever. And just hacked my way through a couple of years of, you know, youth group bands and mm-hmm. then figured out like, oh, I'm actually pretty good now. Or I'm getting better. You know, a couple of years in, I could actually hold my own, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, it's just, re- it's a good reminder. Like it doesn't matter which way you go, Yeah. but the, the, um, the opportunity to have sort of a group invite you in to play music with other people is really crucial and, and key to getting getting going with this stuff. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So that so that's really how I started playing music was at, at church. And then I, when I went to college and met these guys, yeah, you know, they all had grown up playing in church too. So we just had this shared kind of experience of music. And none of us had really been in bands before. This was all of our first bands. <laughs> and right. so we were we were all just kind of all in. Um just from the get go of this band. So now you, but you guys did a band thing, and and somehow you got some. Did you uh, interact with a record label or anything like that? Yep. Or was so we uh, <clears throat> a couple years into the band, we were all working side jobs after we graduated college. But we were kind of waiting. We felt like something was coming for the band. We just didn't know what it was. But there, the shows were getting bigger. Um, there was some radio play starting to happen, things like that. But we didn't have a record deal. But we all figured like if this is going the way that our friends' bands have gone, like they've all been signed. So we feel like, you know, and so we just had this sense. And then sure enough, you know, we had a few conversations start to happen with record labels and we ended up signing with a label called Tooth and Nail. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, out of C- uh, Seattle. And so, and the, you know, a lot of those bands on that label, we had all grown up listening to forever and stuff. So it was kind of a big deal for us. And did that. you guys stay within that Christian contemporary music world or did you kind of, had you sort of started mm-hmm. there and then moved on to just um, secular music, I guess? You'd yeah. Call it. Yes and no. Um, we, we, all of the, so all the guys in the band, including myself, we, you know, we're all Christians. And so that was a big part of our music and what mm-hmm. we wanted to communicate through the band. But we also didn't just want to play shows with other Christian hardcore bands, you know, because that that's very much a world that you can kind of, there, there's obviously different paths for different bands, but we kind of wanted to do some of that, but then also tour with tons of other bands that mm-hmm. didn't identify, you know, as a Christian band or whatever. Cool. And so, yeah, so we toured all over the country. We went, went to Germany and played some festivals and um, it was, it was a very chaotic two years after we signed that record deal. And the only reason I stopped touring with that band is uh, I met my wife. <laughs> right on. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, at that point, I'm kind of skipping ahead, but at that point, I really f- had figured out, like, I think the studio is what I want to do, like, for a career career. And I, I happened to meet my wife at that time, and everything coalesced into this kind of like, okay, I think it's time to exit stage left for a little bit. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah, some- that's great. Yeah. And so, like, getting your new studio built and settling in is sort of part of the the switch into a, a life of balance between family, parenthood, yep. as well, yeah, and yep. uh, and um and and continuing to do the music and finding a balance of these things. That's a hundred percent right. Yeah, I so I I essentially just to kind of race through the story. I basically I left. Uh, the band, I got married and then I worked at a church for a little bit. And then I, I, as soon as I got busy enough to take all of my vacation time in a year by like March, I had taken all my vacation time just to work on records with people. And so, uh, I talked to my wife and I was just like, you know, I don't know how to do like a nine to five kind of job and also do this. And I'm so busy already. You know, it was just kind of this like turning point moment for me a couple of years into, uh, like the post band life. And then I, I basically jumped in full time. It, it was like eight or nine years ago, I think. So been doing it full time for eight or nine years. What were some challenges for you about the pivot into full time record making? Like what were some of the things, what were some of the bridges that you had to cross mm. that you could share with the rock stars about like, you know, it's okay when this part seems like it sucks, but really you got to just do this bit and it's it's all going to work out. Yes. Uh yeah, a lot of thoughts on that. Um 
I'm sure a lot, I think a lot of people talk about this one, but definitely the finances of it were very tricky, um, especially just as a quote unquote newlywed. You know, we were still a couple of years in. My wife was working, but we were both kind of uh, figuring out what we wanted to do long term and things like that. And so it, it, we didn't have this huge nest egg kind of saved up for that. We kind of just, you know, we. Yeah had some school debt and some other things that we were trying to kind of get out from under. And and all of that was during me starting kind of my studio journey full time. Figure if you're going to have, if life's going to be a challenge, let's just double down on it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. And we're, you know, we're just kind of, we're, we're kind of like stubborn people in that way where we're just like, we want to do this. So let's just kind of, you know, figure yeah. out a way to do it. So um, we, uh, we just jumped in. What, uh, and again, I, I, I always, I hit you with questions because I think of them. So if I, oh, I love it. if you feel like I'm derailing you mid story, just keep oh, going. Not at all. But, but, um, what do you want to say about stuff that you figured out just in terms of, um, you know, this show of course is about the studio. It's about making records, but the family life balance is also a crucial mm -hmm. part of that. Mm -hmm. And if we don't figure out how to balance that, we don't get to make records sometimes. Correct. So um, what did you guys, what do you want to say about that ability to navigate the, like the really tricky financial uncertainty and, and hold the marriage and parenting mm -hmm. and stuff like that, you know, is communication a key part of that? Did you, have you seen, uh, examples of it not working elsewhere? Definitely seen examples. Yes. Um, I can mostly just speak to my experience, which is, um, you know, like very point blank, like family comes way above work and music to me. You know, I, th there's, there's no, outside of my family, there's very little that I care about as much as making music. So for family to be even that much higher than music for me is like, I've just had to place it on that stage just because, um, you know, once you have that priority list in place in your head mentally, it gets a lot easier to figure out when you should be doing stuff and and the allocation of your time and energy. Um, so yeah. I, I have I have two little kids now. I have a two year old and a one month old, and so we you know we're we're navigating this right now. It, you yeah. know, it's how do we do this in a way that you know, I'm present because that, that's by far the most important thing for me is to be present for my wife and kids, you know? Yeah. And yeah, then, I think that's great insight. And mm -hmm. I know for myself, you know, I went through some struggles with that. And and sometimes it's a question of, I, I think I instinctively wanted to do it, but mm -hmm. I don't think I had the clarity of thinking and verbalizing it that you do at your age, you know? So congrats <laughs> on that, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, I, I have also gotten the you know, I, I have a wonderful community of people here, you know, both the mastermind group, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Yeah. And, and also just my wife and I just here in Columbus have an incredible community of friends and stuff. And so definitely iron sharpens iron to some degree here with some friends. And we get to we get to hash all this out every week together, uh, some friends and I. So I, I definitely can't stray that far from <laughs> the important stuff without people beating down my door, which is such a healthy, you know, like system to have, you know, if, if you're yeah. blessed enough to, you know, to have that. So, but yeah, communication, like you said, man, that is like that. It just begins and ends with that. You know, if, if I'm communicating well with my wife and kids, they're like the world opens up to me and what I can do and, and just the joy of what I'm doing is so much greater versus me kind of withdrawing and, squeezing time in the studio and being like, I'll be right back, you know, and like kind of like fighting the flow of it. It's yeah. just, that doesn't work, <laughs> at least for me, you know. Native Instruments introduces the new Complete 15 Bundle, featuring Contact 8, offering versatile synths, sampled instruments, and innovative effects. Perfect for creating everything from emotional scores to dance floor grooves. Contact 8 includes exciting new creative tools like chords and phrases for inspiration, the Leap tool for dynamic looping, and Conflux, a hybrid instrument blending organic and 
synth sounds. The Complete 15 bundle also includes updated Massive X, Guitar Rig 7 Pro, and AI-enhanced Isotope Ozone 11. Use the code ROCK10 for 10% off at nativeinstruments.com. Empirical Labs, creators of the famous Distressor, offer high-performance gear for audio pros. The Fatso adds warmth to digital recordings with harmonic generation, tape emulation, and compression. The Pump, a 500 series compressor, features eight selectable ratios, precise attack and release controls, saturation, and an attack mod for incredible transient control. The Arouser and Big Freak plugins are also available at Empirical labs.com where you can use the coupon code rsr10 for 10 percent off follow at empirical labs on instagram making studio gear that works a little easier a little better and a lot longer it's fascinating to hear you describe it because that like what you said squeezing time into the studio i'll be right back just a few more i just got to knock this thing up <laughs> <laughs> Those are like, we all know what that means. You know, We've done studio. it, yeah, yeah. And there's there's all sorts of experiences, and some people, you know, find different ways to balance that. But it's cool to hear you talk about it. And um, I think many of us would love to experience an ideal balance of, of family and life and studio stuff. And, you know, here we talked at the very beginning about letting some light in the window into your control room. Mm -hmm. And I know that for me, that switch from you know, at least a decade of wake up, go into the studio, eat dinner, go back to the studio, mm -hmm. uh, work until my eyes can't stay open and just do it again seven mm -hmm. days a week. But then switching to like family life was very tricky, you know, mm -hmm. and it was the first time I ever had to do things like tell everybody else, say, hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm stopping at dinner. I'm going to like put my kids to bed and stuff. Mm -hmm. So very cool, man. So, so where do you want to go from there? Um, talk a little bit more about some of those studio experiences and then building the studio you've got now, sort of getting yeah. from experience in the studio to creating your own world. Yeah, for sure. So, um, several years ago, I started to rent out a commercial space here in Columbus. Um, and I, it wasn't a, a studio per se when I first took it over, but it was just this kind of blank canvas room that um, I worked in for a few years. And then dur <laughs> during COVID, I was so bored. And, you know, th there was some there was some stimulus checks, you know, things like that, that I'm sure we all, you know, uh -huh. and so th there was a little bit of a moment where I figured, hey, I could actually turn this room into something that I've just always wanted, you know, and just in terms of some treatment and a little bit of gear here and there, things like that. And so I, I you know, during COVID, I, I, taught myself kind of some basic construction stuff. I'm in no way a contractor, but you know, just just little things here and there. And so I turned this commercial space into a much nicer studio to be in. Um, and that was, you know, three or four years ago. And then I just recently moved into this space a couple months ago. So um and that was when you talk about converting a studio, you're you're sort of approaching it from the you've got one room to work in as opposed to a Studio with isolated, correct ISO booths and you know correct. drum yep. room or anything. Like so that. I actually really grew to love, like, kind of on a side note, I really grew to love the idea of working in the same room as everybody, and and yeah. it's all I really knew. I think there were times where having a control room and a live room would be awesome, especially just when you're tracking. It's really mm -hmm. nice to kind of have that separation. Yeah, but but really, if you if you just kind of rock with headphones. You, you you know, you get part of the way there, you know, you just kind of, you have to make sure your phone's on silent, things like that, that are just yeah. kind of funny, like isms of working in a room with people. But what are some uh, other things? I mean, so if we're, if yeah. we're going to stay on that topic for a minute, yeah. it used to be a bigger deal maybe than it is now, mm -hmm. but it used to be that the Pro Tools rig, the computer, it was a lot of loud fans, you know, that you'd be trying mm. to figure out what to do with. Um, and sometimes if you had the right kind of setup, you could move the computer away from you into its own closet or something. Yeah. Other times you just had to deal with it. I spent a lot of time dealing with it. Um, <laughs> is that something that you had to figure out as well? Uh, it definitely is. Uh, not as much with the computer stuff, but definitely with HVAC. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was that was uh, in the particular room that I was in. It was in a hundred and forty year old building. It was a historical building. It was beautiful brick, you know, all of that. But the HVAC in it was very much after after market installed or whatever. Like it was retrofitted onto the building, so it definitely was not like sound was not prioritized at all. It was just the furnace would kick on to the AC and it would just kind of blast, you know. And it cooled the room right down, which was great, but it it you kind of had to stop and all that. So my way of dealing with that, I had a couple ways. I got a thermostat that I could control with my phone. So if we were recording, uh, you know, I was kind of self-conscious about it at first, honestly, when I first built the room, because I thought like, man, in like in a in a big time studio, like this isn't even a thing, and da-da-da. I'm in one room and what are, you know, are people gonna be annoyed at this? And I think one person in four years ever even mentioned it. It just wasn't a big deal because I kind of figured out a way to just turn it off when I needed to. Um, I built these really nice kind of movable gobos, which is a really awesome room within a room sort of setup. I built two or three of these where you could just, I could make kind of an ISO booth if I wanted to, um, you know, or like have dead drums and push them up against the kid and things like that. So, so would that, this be like, this would be like, uh, so the room probably has to be big enough that you're setting up in too. Yeah. Right? It was you a very large room. Yeah. yeah so that was, helps a lot. Cause that gives you that flexibility yep. to move around a little bit and hundred percent. Yeah. Set up drums yep. and still have your control room space. So when you're talking about the gobos, then maybe, uh, do we picture a couple of tall gobos and then you can have somebody up against the wall and then can you like set another one on top of the gobos so that becomes like this short, this mini Mm -hmm. ceiling, like you're building a little ISO room right there? Yeah. So the way that I did that is I built these two large like gobos on wheels and then I put uh, a moving blanket on top of that, which... I'm I'm a very um I'm very interested and I love like d- interior design and style and stuff with and when it comes to spaces so having a blanket to me felt kind of weird but then I just realized like man it just works so well yeah. like I don't whatever you know and so I I just built these nice gobos and then I would just put this huge heavy blanket and it just sounded like it was in any dead studio that I've ever been in you know well the other part about that that can be kind of cool especially if the sounds not coming back into the little go boat area too mm-hmm. much is in a a lot of times when we set up in a small room and then we deaden everything we think we're going to get that dead sound but what one of the problems is all we manage to do is deaden all the high frequencies and all the mid frequencies but the low ones are still booming around cuz it's really hard to soak them up yeah but if you create what you described in a larger space you get the double benefit of you sort of dead in the highs and the mids and you you give it that tighter sound, but the lows escape into the larger room. Yes, yes. They escape into the larger room and they just escape out of the super old building vibes of like the windows or just the door. Or what, you know, it was kind of like where I was in the room. Like you definitely, there was some bleed out to the outside. So I think I, I noticed after a while exactly what you're saying. I noticed there was not really a buildup in the low end with that. So it, yeah, yeah, I kind of lucked out with that for sure. So that could be a nice, nice win. It's, it's yeah. good. I think it's good to talk about these things a little bit just yeah. because some of the rock stars listening, just like, you know, light bulb goes off or somebody's yeah. setting up their room somewhere and they're like, oh yeah, that's going to work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, cool. So you had the larger space. Now you when you're building your new space and the whole air conditioning thing, it's just, we all kind of have to deal with it at some point. Um, now that you moved into your new space, did you find uh, a new way to deal with the HVAC? Um, not exactly. So this space is connected to the rest of my house, but it's pretty it's pretty isolated. So that that's nice. We built this wall actually behind me here. It's about a foot thick. Um, so it's very very quiet in here. The there is a HVAC vent in the room here, but it's much much quieter than. Um, the other building was, <laughs> so mm-hmm. frankly, so unless I'm doing vocals uh, in this room, uh, it's not really it hasn't been an issue so far. Yeah. So, so yeah. one of the um, so we'll stay on that for just a moment because again, mm-hmm. I think this is a common topic in my podcast studio. Which I'm still naming for, for now. We'll call it Podzilla today. Podzilla. Uh, in Podzilla, um, <laughs> there's HVAC. I'm also in the house and it was pretty loud. So I had to like cover the vent and stuff. Otherwise it was too loud. I felt like, and then what we did was we, but it was a straight pipe underneath the 
floor that was running from the HVAC over to the vent going up into my room. It was just straight metal pipe. Hmm. And so we just cut that out and then just put in a snaking back and forth flexible vent. And that really did the trick. Just that, just that snaking S curve downstairs um, made out of, you know, the soft fabric-y stuff really just quieted down. It, it shut, it, uh, it lowered, I think the velocity of the air coming out of the vent in my podcast studio, but it also quieted it down. So those can be simple hacks sometimes for, um, home studio setups. But Jeremy, I'd point out to the rock stars too, that one of the things when you do the single room, like you're doing now you're only worried about a couple of things. You're worried about the sound of the air coming out, getting onto vocal mics and stuff, right? But you're right. also worried about um, other sounds in the house getting into the studio. Mm -hmm. But if we were in a studio with ISO boost, then now we have to worry about like, now the drums are coming from one of the rooms into the other room. Correct. And that yeah. because that's where, where it's tricky. So there's different, just pointing out to listeners, there's different levels of, how much we need to worry about it in different studio situations. I think what I have figured out is that there is no perfect setup and scenario, which, you know, again, you know, this, that's not news to anybody, but I think I wanted that when I first started doing this, I wanted a space that was just no issues, just kind of, blah, and then, then I learned about HVAC, then I learned about acoustics and physics. I went, I really went down the rabbit hole of learning about physics and how sound moves and, you know, all that stuff when I was building this room and the other space. And uh, again, no means an expert, but learn that like, if you want to have the perfect room, you need like 30 foot walls and you need to be like floating in a bubble, like, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So it's just, Studio you know, in space. Yeah, exactly. You need to be in like a, you know, on the ISS, you know, satellite or whatever, and, you know, not be around That'd anybody. Be some lonely record making up there. <laughs> sessions would be pretty hard to get to. Boy, when it's when the sun rises up there, it gets pretty hot. It just hits you straight on. Straight up, yeah. Nice um, wind. Oh. Do you remember any good resources for learning this stuff? Yes. Um, I there's a few links which I I'm happy to share. I found some really awesome, um, way more in depth than I would ever do. But somebody made some how different materials and fabrics affect sound differently. So that mm -hmm. if so if you're building. Um, you, you can really figure out the materials to buy and the, the materials to kind of stay away from when you're building acoustic treatment. Um, so I have a big cloud above me. I have a ton of uh, diffusion or uh, absorption on the walls here. And this back wall is all absorption as well. It's Look at you go. Yeah, it does just yeah. some of the right moves. It took me a long yep. time. It wasn't until I, I worked with the studio designer, Carl Tatz, that we finally put enough treatment in my control room. I Which I was much... actually, I was poking around on your website last night. Your studio is gorgeous. Oh, thanks, I am man. very jealous. It's beautiful. <clears throat> yeah. I'll pass that on to Carl. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I've actually but I mean, like for a while. So just just to reiterate your point is I went for a long time with too much drywall exposed in my control room. Mm. And again, like we talked about earlier, you don't want too little. You don't want too much deadening because right. then the sound just gets soaked up and now you have trouble controlling the low end. But yep. but we ended up with a great balance in my space and it took like, you know, covering that back wall with tons of insulation and and the ceiling was a spot we had blown, I had blown off for years. Yeah, Because you don't always think of the ceiling. Like I had the cloud, mm -hmm. but it wasn't until we actually treated with panels, um, 703 panels hanging down the, all along the ceiling that it really made a big mm -hmm. difference because there's a wood floor, you know, because you want to roll your chair around. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, I, I've gotten pretty far with some clouds and, and a nice rug and um, taking care of most of the walls. You know, I, I found, I think, too, just on a side note, the last room that I was in for several years, it was a pretty live room. Um, I had the secret that I have found is uh, tubes, tube traps. I have a bunch of tube traps in this room too. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in tubes mm -hmm. and just the way that they affect sound. Um, so I built not the tubes like, in your guitar amps, Rock. Not the tubes. These no, are no. physical tubes. I do love those tubes though. So too. But. Yeah, I can see it in your website photo. Mm -hmm. um, and this might be the oh. previous space. I don't know if that's the other one or this one. It's the previous space. Yeah. Yeah. But you yeah. like, again, you were dealing with 
look like a cool spot because you've got a exposed brick wall. Yep. So it's got that vibe of like an urban coffee shop. And I know Columbus has some beautiful, um, uh, some commercial spaces. John Finnell has been on the show before Relay Recording. Oh, awesome. And, and we yeah. spent a bunch of time at his studio too. But But you put up these big panels and then those curved tubes, I mean, the round tube traps, you can set them up in front of you like a wall and then kind of set yes. your speakers in them and stuff like that. So that's cool. That, that was a transformational moment for me when I finally bought those. I bought them used. I drove to Brooklyn in like a 24-hour road trip. I drove out to Brooklyn, bought them from some guy and drove back the next morning and put them in. Got to do that. Got to do those yeah. studio road trips. I drove two days out to Durango, Colorado, and two days back sleeping in <laughs> the, just sleeping in the, in the back of my minivan to go pick up a tape machine when I was building my studio. <laughs> I, I have a, a, a Juno 106 synth here and I, I drove to West Virginia to a pawn shop on a, on a whim, you know, it, sometimes you find stuff and it's like, if I wait, it's going to be gone. And, you know, so, and I'm just the kind of guy too, that I'm like, ah, I love a road trip. I'll just hop in the car. <laughs> right <laughs> so, on. Yeah. Um, well, so let's see, let's, what, what else do we want to talk about? So if you're setting up the control room for sound, do you have what monitors do you use and how do you like to set those up? I use Atom A7X monitors and I oh, have great. the matching Atom sub. I forget the, I think it's the sub 10, the, the larger one um, that Atom recommends you pair with the A7Xs. So that's awesome. I, I bought these monitors, you know, they're, for those that don't know, I mean, they're relatively affordable. I would say they're probably 1500 bucks a pair, something mm -hmm. like that. You know, they're, you could probably even get them a little cheaper if they're used, but. Uh, and they also have some built-in room correction options, right? They do. Yeah, they have, it's more like uh, you can juice or kill certain frequencies. So yeah, you could really tailor it to your room for sure. And I used Sonarworks for a while and worked with the Atoms, but I ended up just having a pretty bad experience with room correction stuff. So I just kind of figured out, like, I think I just want to treat the room and get used to it and then just mix kind of, and never have yeah. to worry about that. So yeah. that was that was my journey with that. But I... I have decided to purposefully just stay with one pair of monitors for as long as I can get life out of these guys. Because mo I mean, monitors, they don't, you know, you don't really touch them. They don't move. They they can kind of last for, you know, if you're, if you're if nice you're, to them. If you're nice to them. Yeah. If you're not like smoking right in the, the cones, and, like if you're just kind of like treating them well, they can last forever. Well, when I think about not being nice to speakers, it was usually an overdub session. Mm. You know, it's like I, my NS10s went out on a bass overdub years ago. Just cranking, you know. cranking them up. Yeah, or like, you know, cranking the kick drum and the speaker cones are just leaping out. And I, 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 the Atoms, of course, are they've got some processing in them, too, so they may have some protection right. from that as well. But um, just, well, just uh, the yeah. biggest thing that I found to just, you know, there's probably somebody listening to this that will get some use out of this thought, but... I didn't use a sub for a long time because I had, like all of us did when we're thinking about something new, we'll hop online and read tons of reviews and da, da, da. So I had looked at several people that said, oh man, subs in my room, it was terrible. Like I couldn't mix anymore. Just the, you know, I couldn't get the low end dialed. So I just sent it back, you know? And so I was like, ah, oh, maybe I don't need a sub. And then eventually I just realized like, I, you know, I'm working on like indie pop, like, little like dancier stuff now. Mm -hmm. And like, I need to really like, I, I don't love mixing on headphones. So I really love to feel it, you know, in the room. And so I was like, I should look into an appropriate sub for my setup. Well, so I ended up just getting the matching sub that Adam recommended. Once I did that, I realized that if you route it all correctly, and you're you're carving all the low end out of your near field monitors, and it's just going to the sub, which is really the correct way to do it. For, for most people anyway, mm -hmm. um, your near fields sound amazing at that point. Like I noticed a remarkable immediate difference in just how the quality of the uh, A7Xs when I was routing everything below 80 or whatever, 70 or 80 to the sub. And it was like, oh my gosh, like the, everything just sounds better and cleaner. <laughs> 
Someone asked me a while back, do you fear AI will one day replace you as a mastering engineer? Well, it hasn't yet. That's because algorithms don't listen to music or to clients. Hi, I'm Brian Murphy of Soundporter Mastering. When I master, I experience the music as your fans will, with the honesty of fresh ears. And unlike AI, I master with your intentions in mind, not merely to process the mix and boost the levels. If you want an experienced live engineer to master your music as only a human can, find me at soundporter.com. Sick of searching for the right cable or wondering how to hook up your studio? Trace Audio has you covered. Based in Nashville but serving studios everywhere, Trace Audio specializes in custom cables, patch bay labels, and wiring solutions for home and pro studios. Try out the free online custom patch bay label designer at traceaudio.com to easily color code, label, and organize your XLR or quarter inch bays, which are popular with home studios. It's sleek, professional, and simple to use. Then use the code RSR15 for 15% off printing and shipping your custom patch bay labels to take your studio to the next level. That's funny that you say that because right on the heels of me blowing up my speakers, (laughs) I switched over ultimately to the Carl Tatt setup and in its near fields with a sub, and it does have a crossover. Mm -hmm. And he even pointed out to me that it would be hard to blow them because we're just not pushing uh, the, uh, yeah, I know the sub, I don't know, maybe we could do some damage to the subs, but but the um, speakers, we're just not pushing a lot of low end through them Yep, because of the crossover. So that really, that does actually breathe some potential extra life into those near fields as well. Yeah. And I I really specifically noticed it when I kind of turned the system up louder, there wasn't this mushiness or kind of, I don't know, it's hard to describe sound with words sometimes, but just th- this kind of lack of clarity in the lower mids and low end, you know, that yeah. you would expect to, you know, it's a seven or a, yeah, I guess a seven inch woofer, you're not going to get like 30 Hertz out of that, you know, right, <laughs> but the right. dub goes down to 20 or 30 Hertz. Like I can clearly hear a su- like a sine wave that low, you know, um, so, yeah, yeah, and it, it, that sounds similar to the lesson you learn about mixing too, where it's like you you learn to be careful with the low end, and you learn the power of mm-hmm. high pass filters on things that don't need to have all that sub information because, right, in the end you're trying to pack so much up forward in the mix, and that yeah. stuff just it just it just eats up the the headroom really. It yes. eats up the the space for power. Yeah, I'm still learning that. <laughs> so, I think we all are. I think it's, yeah. a, it's a you know it's a constant pursuit of trying to figure out what the best best balance of all that is. Yeah, absolutely. So, what are some other tools in front of you and your studio setup? So i I wish I could just like take my webcam and show you here. I uh, have really developed a philosophy of find the tools I love and keep them forever, and just get rid of stuff I don't use. And so. You know, this room is still getting put together, but there's really not a ton of room of gear in here other than um, I decided several years ago really to just invest in instruments mostly mm-hmm. and leave a lot of the, um, you know, mixing and things like that, uh, tools for that more so in the DAW, which, you mm-hmm. know, I think is a lot of people are doing now. But um, I, I also... We didn't touch on this too much earlier, but I also rent space at another studio in town when I have bigger sessions, and they have a console and a, you know, just an entire wall of outboard gear. Oh, and, great! Yeah, and so I get I get kind of my fix of getting to you know really dial compressors in and pushing stuff and all that fun kind of gear stuff without really having the the price tag <laughs> that I have to eat at the end of the day with it. I just get to rent space and and do that. So I, you know, it's been, it's been really nice to have this room to focus on one thing and then have this other studio that I rent in town to focus on bigger, you know, so I have, I've got, yeah. So I guess the stuff that I, I really use a lot are this, um, I invested pretty heavily into like a Kemper rig a couple of years ago for stuff. So I'm sure a lot of people know what that is. If you don't know, it's basically, uh, an amp, "Quote unquote modeler system." They they really don't like to call it that because it's it's a very uh, bespoke kind of way that they set up their system. Kemper does and stuff, but it's essentially an amp modeler system 
that, you know, I've used all of them. I've used Axe Effects and Kemper, mm-hmm. and all the pedals and stuff. And, and we've talked about some of that stuff recently on the podcast too. Oh, cool. But, okay. But an, a thought that pops into my mind, I don't know if you're doing this, but it occurs to me that if you're doing the my studio plus going to the tracking room studio, mm-hmm. sometimes in those tracking spaces, those are where you have the opportunity to like do big ass guitar sounds or something, or you get a sound that you really love. Have you have you found that it can be cool to take your Kemper with you to the tracking studio and then you capture that sound when you get a killer guitar sound and then you can bring it back to your studio for continuing overdubs or or even doing guitar repairs or any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I haven't done a ton of guitar tracking at that studio yet. Um, I've mostly been using it for drums and some kind of like larger band session kind of things. But that would be a cool way to test out what the Kemper can do in a larger room. Because I, I typically use it uh, just as like a like spit if into my interface kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- the thing that I really love about the Kemper that I think is pretty underrated is there are so many outputs on this thing. You can run simultaneously. You can run two channels into your interface. You can run two extra channels to an outboard rack piece of gear and crunch something up and blend that back in. You can also run two XLRs out into another interface and blend different sounds that way. Um, You can use it if you use Spitif on it. You can run it as a stereo rack effects processor for any track in your DAW. And so I use it all the time to crunch up stuff when I'm mixing and just print it back into Pro Tools. And it really is this kind of like dream mixing (laughs) machine even though it's not really marketed that way it's if you really figure out how to route it correctly it can just do anything you really want it to do and then you can also just hook it into like a, the effects loop of an amp and treat it just like a guitar head you know kind of so thing. when you're doing a stuff like um meow boys uh king of acting normal one of the records in your discography and, and mm-hmm. rock says we have a link to jeremy's music in the show notes so you can scroll down and go listen to some of these records um and you know there's there's it sounds like there may be um, distortion tastefully used on vocals at times and things like that. Do you find the Kemper is actually part of that process for you for even like mixing with vocals? Yes, yes. So I use it. I use it pretty. I'm actually starting to do this more and more, but I am using it a lot as like a vocal effects processor. I don't remember on that track. I don't know that we use the Kemper because this kind of spit if in and out situation is sort of a newer revelation for me. Right. And I, we all, I, we're always, every time we build our new studio, we like, we stumble <laughs> on this like whole new way of doing things. Yeah. Like, totally and we all that. look at our back catalog and we're like, man, I should have done it, you know, on that or whatever. But, um, well, that sounds awesome. Um, uh, let's, let's rewind a tiny bit and talk about some of the stuff that you've learned about having your studio, but then taking advantage of other bigger tracking studios, you are producing records. I assume that's a that's part of your production process if you're doing that. Correct. Um, what have you learned about smart ways for you to take a production from start to finish with the band where you do the pre-production, then go into the tracking studio, do the tracking? Um, you know, I think a, a question mark that could come up in our um in the listener's mind is how do I do I how do I charge for what I'm doing if we're going to another studio and using it there? Because so many of us think of our studio as part of the value proposition for what we bring. So talk about some of that stuff. Talk about your, your process of production. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. So let's see where to start. Um, Pre-production. Pre-production. Yes. (laughs) Or deciding you want to work with the band. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I think like a lot of people, when you are in the first stage of a career in this world, um, you realize pretty quickly that you don't necessarily want to be the choosiest person in the world if you want to do it full time and actually have some money in the bank. And especially if you have a family, things like that, you know, you 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 it's easy to undervalue the idea of having financial stability. And so mm-hmm. I think when you realize that that's important, I think it's easy to kind of take on a lot of work and, and not, not always, um, 
I'm trying to get better at uh, choosing work that comes that I think was going to further my career rather than just taking it. You know, sometimes you have to do both. But yeah, that's a so tricky, th- it's a it's, tricky balance indeed. It's an incredibly tricky balance. It has no objective answer. It's completely subjective to everybody. And, and the balance of kind of we talk about this all the time in our mastermind group mm-hmm. of you know, how do you choose projects? How do you charge appropriately for things and all of that? So it's definitely still a learning process. But to answer your question, yeah, I think. If I've sort of decided I, I, you know, really want to work with this band or this person, I believe in what they're doing. Um, I very much am in the philosophy of I want to become a member of that band. I want to 100% in every way possible pretend, and sometimes not even pretend, uh, <laughs> it, but in real life, I play shows with this band, but really become the fifth member or the fourth member or the sixth member or whatever, or even the second member, if it's just a friend and I wanting to work on a record together. Because, uh, you know, I'm coming at this from a musician standpoint where I love writing songs. Uh, There are uh, way better songwriters than me out there, but I love writing songs from a foundational point of view and then fleshing that out into production. They're very much the same thing for me. It's not two different stages, like songwriting and production are just like, mashed together for me. It's good to hear you say that. It's good to hear yeah. somebody say there's better out there, but that doesn't stop me from doing it, you know? Because oh, I no. think it's a lot of times people just let the imposter syndrome, you know, make the decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And there, are, you know, I, I'm a competitive guy. I, I listen to music and I hear stuff and I think like, dang, like, that's awesome. How, how do they do that? You know, I get, I get riled up about that in a good way, or it's just, it pushes me, you know, there's, when I was first starting out, there were times where I got pretty depressed and I thought like, I don't know, I have no idea how to do that or whatever, you know? And then the longer you do it, you realize it's not actually that hard to get cool sounds, but it's really how you use them. That's the hard part. And how do you, how do you Tetris things together in a way that people want to listen to more than once? <laughs> you know, I love it. Tetris um, things together. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I that's how I, I'm very much a, like, uh, there's a term, I think it's synesthesia, where you see sound as color. I don't see sound as color. I see sound as shapes, like very vivid shapes. And so like Tetris for me actually is like pretty, it's pretty accurate. Like how I like view, like I view the kick drum in this way or whatever. It's just like kind of weird, like mental thing that I do when I'm producing, but. That's um, cool. I I won't, I won't go too far on this, but when I was at the uh, CES conference in Vegas, I met a guy from France who was doing something called Cinegram, which was Mm. creating music theory as a circle of of 12 points on a circle. And each chord creates geometric shapes so that you'd learn music that way. You'd learn learn what a chord was by the shape it made instead of these random letters and sharps and flats and all that. That's my kind of thing right there, yeah. I need to get that that info from you. Yeah, that's that sounds awesome. Yeah, but it's it's like very real for me, you know. But yeah, so I, you know, production and songwriting and all of that is very mixed to me. So if I'm if I'm going to work with somebody, I love to just why are you writing songs? What are you writing about? Like kind of those foundational things because that's going to inform what guitar tone I use or who do we get to play drums on the record? Like I work with a lot of singer songwriter like kind of solo uh, people. And I've really come to just have a heart for for that kind of working where like we get to pick the band members for that record. We get to build a different band for every record. And, you know, the longer you do this, the more people you meet. And I, you know, they're at this point now, like I know several drummers that I could just call right now and they all have very different styles and very different strength, you know. Um, That's good to hear too, yeah. especially coming from a, you know, non a quote non music city hub like Nash in Nashville, you sort of expect that there's a bazillion musicians. Yeah. But I think sometimes it can be a question mark in our mind if we live in some other part of the world. It's like, can I have a bunch of musicians on call? And it, probably the answer to that is, duh, of course you can. I mean, you know, Motown yeah. was done in Detroit. You know, yeah. it's like you can yeah. be anywhere. I, I don't, you know. We, we've talked about moving to Nashville for years. And then eventually a few years ago, we decided to buy a house here. And we were like, okay, like, I think, I think we're going to rock it in Columbus for a foreseeable future. And, and so then once that happened, I, you know, I've made some trips down to Nashville and all of that. But th- there's also just been a lot of people presented through projects here and 
Ohio and Michigan, especially and and Kentucky and some surrounding states that like, man, you are a good drummer. Like, where do you live? You know? And then yeah. I'll grab their number and and I'm I'm just the guy that's like, I'll text, like I'll DM or text somebody on Instagram if I love their work and just be like, hey, what what do you charge to like do drums for a, a song? You know? That's great. So sometimes you you've explored remote sessions as well that way? A ton, a ton of times. Yeah. And and sometimes it comes back very fruitful and you get to build a relationship with somebody and and you you've really found like a guy for this kind of thing or whatever or, or a girl or you know whatever but then sometimes it, you know the dm just doesn't get read for a year and it's mm-hmm. like okay you know that it's it's instagram what do i expect you know that's that's fine yeah. I don't well i mean it. now with the ability to so easily zoom in on a session and you could use um audio movers links or whatever and you can hear totally high quality there's something potentially really cool about a drum session happening somewhere else, but you're hearing it on your mix monitors back in your space. Yes. And giving yes. feedback. I don't know if it's always like that. I know there's a, there's a variety of remote sessions. Some just want to do the thing and send it to you, mm-hmm. but I'm, I assume it's also possible to listen in on sessions. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't done audio movers as much as some people I know have. Uh, they've really gravitated toward that. I, I tend to work with people where they'll just send me stuff. Um, maybe they have like an Apollo and they're in their basement or something, or they're like at a friend's studio and they maybe don't have the, the rig, but right. The whole it, live streaming. Rig yeah. To, it's, to I think it's, it's a bit of a commitment, but I, I, yeah. Good finally, reminder to us. Yeah. Not yeah. to assume that everybody would be able to do that. Right. Right. Cause I um, didn't for a long time. So, well, let me, let me pivot to this one. Uh, if you go with the band into a big tracking space studio in town, I uh, just talk about this the dumb question people want to ask. How do you charge for that? That's what's a, great a, what's a good way to think about that. So I the way that I have done it is I have developed a relationship with the people that are booking these studios, aka people that are either studio managers or friends of mine that are co-owners of the place or or something like that, where there's a personal connection somehow to the person that I would be connecting with to to book the room. And there's only really one or two that I like there's one main one in town like I don't I don't want to pretend like there's like 12 huge studios in Columbus cuz there's not, you know. There's there's a couple really nice ones that are great for tracking. And the one that I use typically um I have developed a relationship with the guy booking it and we've worked out a really healthy rate uh, per hour. So I can basically book it, you know, from 12 to two, or I could do 10 to nine and, you know, do it all. And there's kind of a caps at a certain point where if I just want to book it for a day. And then I, I take the, the, uh, I don't charge that to the artist because for, it's probably specific to my situation, but I, because I have my own commercial space for so long, everything was just an all in number. And that was easy for people to kind of work with. And I'm not charging for my time plus my studio time, like way too confusing. I don't want people looking at the clock either when we're working, I just want to work. So I tend to like, I don't really advertise what I pay to that studio to rent it, if that makes sense. Like I just tell the artist, here's, you know, here's my day rate, or here's the session rate for or, or the project rate really and then i just try to work in you know an appropriate amount of days to track at this space and then just do the rest here and so that's so that's a good um takeaway for us is that when we get bogged down in the details of like how do we, how do we do this and how do i charge for this time and that sometimes the answer is you're you're asking the wrong question like just figure out an overall project rate that makes it really simple for the people you're going to work with right. and then just do the calculations internally. I do all that internally. And I, I, uh, before we even set foot in the studio, I make sure that I'm going to make enough and that, um, you know, that the, obviously the studio needs to get paid cause they're, you know, they're just renting it out to me. I'm just a client to them. Um, mm-hmm. you know, a, cl- a client with a personal relationship, but it's still a business. And so the, I need to make sure. So, so sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll kind of have like a a studio bank account nest egg where if I need to to front the money for that studio for a day, I can do that. And it's not, I'm not begging the artist to pay their invoice ahead of time, getting in this trap of 
getting paid before you do the work. And it's just kind of like, I've, I've been in that position before in the past. And I realized like, I just don't really want to do it that way. I'd rather, I love to do the work and then get paid afterward. And it's worked out well for me, you know, so far. Isotope is truly amazing for mixing and mastering your music. Like the new Isotope Plasma plugin featuring Flux Saturation, which helps you sculpt the harmonics in your sound, enhancing the excitement and clarity of your tracks or mixes. And Ozone, with its built-in mastering assistant, helps you analyze your mix, suggesting all the settings you need for a professionally mastered result based on your chosen style of music and EQ curve, referencing a specific song if you want. Ozone features sophisticated yet simple modules like clarity, impact, low-end focus, state stabilizer, imager, exciter, and spectral shaping, along with powerful dynamic EQ, compression, and limiting, allowing you to adjust the settings to your taste so it sounds incredible. And with the magic of master rebalance, you can even manipulate the vocal, bass, and drums separately at the mastering stage. Use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off Plasma Ozone RX or any of the fantastic plugins at isotope.com. Adam Audio is celebrating 25 years of researching, developing, and manufacturing industry-leading monitoring solutions in Berlin. To mark this milestone, our friends at Adam Audio are unveiling a special limited edition series of monitors that will look stunning in your studio and sound as awesome as your music. Introducing the Arctic White A4V and A7V series. Available for a limited time to pro and home studio owners like yourself, the clean, glossy white finish exudes a luxurious feel and will stand out in any studio or home audio system. Featuring the XART accelerated ribbon tweeter design and customizable speaker voicings, the Arctic White A4V and A7V retain the full specifications of the original design. Plus, with Sonarworks integration for automated room correction, you can fine-tune your monitors to your control room's acoustics. Adam Audio's commitment to delivering professional-grade, high-fidelity sound to studios worldwide has made these monitors a perfect fit for Grammy-winning producers in both pro and home studios for a quarter of a century. Now you can bring that beautiful, high-fidelity sound to your own productions and make your studio look as as cool as your music sounds. Don't miss out on the limited edition Arctic White A4V and A7V monitors. Available for a short time with the standard extended five-year warranty at adamaudio.com. Howdy, rock stars. We're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Jeremy Steckel, joining us from Columbus, Ohio. And Jeremy, are you ready to jam? I am super ready. Let's do All right, it. Cool, man. So the question I wanted to ask you is when you are establishing kind of a flat rate for doing a project, then the next question that we all have is, well, how do we arrive at what that rate should be? And if, if the flat rate in order to be reasonable means that it has to be a significant investment for the artist, you know, cause you want to be able to establish something. Sometimes it's very powerful to learn how to do a spreadsheet, right? Yes. And the first time I did it, it's like, wow, this is cool, you know? But then you start crunching numbers and you're like, ew, uh, well, I mean, this number looks kind of high, but you have, then you, you realize like, well, if we don't do this, I'm not going to make any money working on this project. So you have to, yep. that can be a tricky thing for us. Um, so that, those are the two questions is, what advice do you have for being confident about the budget? Um, do we need to be find other ways to be flexible, like offer a lower budget option to clients? And and then the other part of the question is, if we think we have something great to offer people and the budget is is what it is, how do we establish that trust with all these new people we're working with so that they can realize that it's worth investing in their record because we're we've got a track record. We can deliver them. Mm. something really good at the end. Yeah. 
Great question. Got a few thoughts. Um, I would say that the one of the hardest parts about doing this is figuring out what your rate's going to be. And I think I did not, I don't think I even have it nailed to this day, but I think I have a much better idea very recently of how to do that. And one of the ways that I, I, so I started looking outside of the studio music world to business kind of books and some things, uh, some resources that I felt like would be advantageous to kind of learn about how to price things and how do people think about money when you're not having this artistic creative bend to everything, like like yeah. just a cold objective. How do you, how do successful people look at money? Yeah. <laughs> and one bit of advice that I stumbled on, I, I honestly don't even remember where I heard this, but it's really stuck with me, is if you, on one hand, you want to you want to be affordable, you want to be busy, you want to have work. That's obvious. On the other hand, if you are never, ever getting turned down because of money, like if you're never too expensive for anybody, you're not charging enough. So... I really took that to heart and I didn't really know how to incorporate that when I first was making kind of my my spreadsheet of rates and all of that. And I didn't really know what to do with that, but it felt like a good, it just kind of had this tingle of like, that's a good idea, but I don't understand it yet. And so the more I thought about it, talked to a lot of people, we talk about this all the time in the mastermind group. Like mm -hmm. we talk about money all the time, just because it's so prevalent in everybody's job, no matter what part of audio you're doing, podcasts or recording or mixing or mastering or whatever. And so I basically just sort of cold picked a number that I felt like if I do this, you know, if I have three days a week or, you know, anywhere from two to four days a week, or really, I, I actually would do it for a month. If I had X number of days a month at this rate, that's a that's a relatively normal, not gaudy, but not dirt poor income. Like what's like a middle of the road income? I think, you know, I think there's, you know, the average household income in America is like 50 or 55,000, something like that. So that that could be a useful way to just start, okay, what what is the middle of the road? And then how do I, how many days would I have to work at my current rate to get to that? And if it's like 450 days a year to get to that, then you're not charging enough money because you like probably can't even get to the median, you know, to yeah, something. Yeah, and if that's, you're, it's yeah. a good takeaway too, to remember that Rockstar is like, uh, depending on where you live to your your needed your median overhead might be slightly different, so you might have totally, totally. Might, you know, you might be a, a expensive city, and you're like, I can barely get by without this. You might be out in the countryside, and you've got, yep. you know, yeah, life is cheap, but you got great internet, and you can get away yep. with something very different. Also worth acknowledging, there's an enormous difference between what I needed to live on when I was 26 without kids and you know, a decade later, got two kiddos and stuff. They're, they're just, mm -hmm. The numbers are a little different. Yeah. So w specific to my situation, uh, my wife is a stay-at-home mom. And so we, so I am the, you know, I'm the sole income of the family. And so that, that really clarifies how much money I need to make. You know, it's mm -hmm. very clear. And I actually really appreciate that. I think when she left her job, when we started having kids and stuff, like we, the plan all along was for her to stay home. And that clarified a lot for me. Just, uh, it was definitely a, a shock of cold water, like having a, one part of our income just go away for sure. Even though we had planned for it, it was still kind of this like, oh my goodness, like, wow, this is, this is a new way of life, you know? <laughs> but that, yeah, like I said, it just, it was clarifying. Okay. I, I need to just charge a certain amount for my rates or else this just isn't going to work. You know, yeah. there's just, just not, I don't want to, I don't want to go into debt. I have a whole history with debt that with school debt and stuff that my wife and I, we really took the Dave Ramsey approach and just uh, right on that we, worked for me too. Yeah. We, yeah, I, I could honestly do a podcast just talking about our like debt-free journey and stuff. And so when we were starting the studio, we decided we want to buy a house someday. We want to have kids someday. Like we don't want to have, you know, 75 grand of student loans and whatever else just kind of like hanging over our heads. So we kind of went scorched earth before we had kids and had some flexibility to work extra jobs and things like that. So that definitely put us in a position now where thankfully we are able to be a little bit more flexible with 
what my rates are and things like that, depending on the project. And again, depending on how much I really want to work on something or whatever. But generally speaking, I don't try to change my rate if I want to work on something or not. I try to stick with my rate because I think there's a value proposition that you're offering somebody when they want to work with you. And for better or worse, like your rate is a big part of what the perceived value of your work. And so the people that I love working with have no problem paying the rate that I have. Some of the challenging folks I've worked with over the years have always been the ones where I'm bending over to kind of like, ah, I could do it for this and da da da. It's just, I, I, it took several years to even have a track record of that. But then I looked back and just realized like, man, I don't really want to work with those guys anymore. And they were the <laughs> ones that I did a record for a few grand or whatever and spent four months on it and just didn't make any money. And, you know, so yeah. you, you definitely, you know, we all learn those lessons, but. So yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I've certainly been down those, those roads as well. And again, I mean, a, a good takeaway for us is every experience just about, I, I, I in my, ex, in my experience, I found that just about every experience has a takeaway that could be really valuable for you if you're willing to look for that silver lining. In other words, you know, sometimes you don't make any money, you work your ass off and everything falls apart. But the 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 pure gold nugget was the lesson that you were trying to teach yourself yes. for next time, you know. And so you gotta yes. it's good to have that reflection. Um, I'm sure the mastermind group is great for that. Um Mm -hmm. And one, uh, let's let's go to that. Actually, let's talk more okay. about that too. But but before we before we do, I just want to comment when you were talking about my rate should be this, or I need to make this much money, and therefore my rate should be this. I think we should remember that if we feel like there's a disconnect between what we can deliver in that rate, mm. we should uh, we should remember that we we have the ability to up the level of what we deliver so that now what we offer and our work does reflect that rate. A thousand percent. And I, that's a great point I wanted to make earlier too. Thank you for reminding me. You having a rate that is not dirt cheap, but also somewhat affordable to the average person, it does, um, it, it's very motivating to deliver excellent work every time. If you are, if you are producing or recording and mixing songs for 150 bucks a song, and you're not kind of starting out and figuring stuff out, if you're like well into your career, but you're really just kind of reaching for those, like just the kind of av average person wants to do something like that. Again, if that's your if that's your road and that's intentional, then this is not for you. But what I'm about to say is not for you. But for everybody else, I feel like that's just going to like you're not going to be really motivated to do excellent work when you're piling up hundreds and hundreds of those super, super cheap, fast, kind of like in and out sort of things. Like at least for me, when I first started out, I was a little bit more in that vein because I wanted to make a certain amount of money and I wanted to just be working all the time and live in the studio and all that. But then I actually love <laughs> making a little bit more per song and working on slightly fewer projects throughout the year and really investing in those projects a lot more because what happens is people hear those projects and they hear the excellent work and they hear they they talk to the the bands that you work with or the people you work with and oh yeah that you know i had a great experience with that and it was an investment and all of that but it was worth it and then yeah. it just kind of it builds off of itself a little bit to some degree for some people faster than others but for, that's it's just been word of mouth for me so far and i think that's just a part of that so so just to say that back to you um a reminder to us is we can look at trying to work on 10 projects for you know, a hundred bucks and the, then none of them pay very well and we don't have enough time to make any of them great. So mm -hmm. 10 things go out that just don't really catch anybody's attention and we didn't enjoy it that much. Um, or you can work on five at 200 bucks, whatever. I don't know. I'm just making up. I don't know what the project oh, yeah. is for those. Same numbers. amount of money, same amount of money, half the, half the projects. <laughs> yeah. I just try to do easy math in my head. Yeah. Um, and now all of a sudden we feel like we can really try and deliver quality on that that you know whopping two hundred dollar project whatever it was, but um but the point being that when those five things go out all of a sudden they sound great and they catch attention and mm -hmm. now the, it's much easier to multiply those five 
projects into, you know, times five. So now you got 25 new projects versus 10 into nothing. Yeah. And maybe at best the same 10 people come back and you still (laughs) don't like those any. Yeah. Yeah. Those 10 people are going to be like, man, I got this for a hundred bucks. Like I should go back to that guy. But the reality is you're just going to have more fun and have more joy working on stuff. It, at least in my experience, I don't think this is always the case. This is very subjective, but yeah. I have tended to find that the more joy I get out of stuff is when there is an investment from the artist financially, time-wise, all of that, because there's a huge... I mean, hiring someone to make a record for you, hiring someone like me should be this big, like, to some degree, like planned out kind of like, we're like investing into a project, right? I want you to have that investment because I am investing my time and my gear and my space and my energy and my joy and my family. Yeah, we both should have a huge investment and those projects are so much fun to work on when everybody's bought in. And the other thing is um, a reminder to us too is if we are making records with people that are taking the creation of that record seriously enough to invest in it, Mm -hmm. then that means they're going to also take the other aspects of the music and the career and the record seriously and invest in those things as well. So true. And if you are making records that are so inexpensive for, for a client that they aren't really investing in the record making, then you can assume the same thing is going to happen for the promotion and the marketing and the the getting that record out there. So it really is, it's like, it 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 goes in every direction, you know, the quality yeah. of the stuff we're trying to participate in. And when you talk about like um, somebody investing in making a record with me, for example, if I'm just putting myself in your shoes, mm-hmm. I think it's a good reminder that if I don't feel, if, if I feel the imposter syndrome, and maybe we can start talking about that and the power of a mastermind group here in a moment, but imposter syndrome, if I'm feeling that, That doesn't, the conclusion doesn't have to be, I'm an imposter. I can't charge that much. What the hell am I thinking? Mm -hmm. It can be, I'm going to level up my, my intention and my goal to make this record so that I match the level of what I'd like to be doing. If I'd like to be working with an artist that really is investing in a record with me, I can choose to do that. And, you know, it's a little bit of the fake it till you make it idea, right? Mm -hmm. And I can start leveling myself up to that point where maybe maybe if I stumble at first, I, then there's some stumbling in there, but I'm going to get there by golly. So you, talk you, about, talk about what, yeah. what's imposter syndrome? What's a mastermind group? Yeah, totally. What's going on, Jeremy? What's, yeah, what is this? Yeah, is this like a secret Illuminati thing? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I totally agree with that. I think uh, I had a thought while you were talking about Um, imposter syndrome. But basically, yeah, I think if you're never uncomfortable working on a project where you feel like you're getting pushed out of your wheelhouse or like the level is so, the the intention from the artist is so high that you're like, man, can I meet this vision? And like, can I do this? If you're never feeling that, then you're probably not working on, uh, I don't want to say important enough projects, but you're probably not like pushing yourself into new areas of working on different levels of work, you know? Yeah. I remember the, I remember the first few times I was doing that. And even when I was touring uh, in the band, you know, like we would all bring song ideas in and stuff. And, and I would hear song ideas from the other guys that are just incredible. And I would think like, man, like I'm not writing songs that good. I need to go back and write a, a song. Like I'm uncomfortable presenting my song idea because your song idea was so good. Yeah. You know, and in that same way, if I'm if I'm in the studio and I'm never like, that is an incredible idea. How do we capture that idea? Because it's so good. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to keep I just repeating. went and saw a show yeah. with songwriters here in Nashville on Saturday night and same thing. I just I saw them mm. doing their songs and I was like, those are really good. Those are good. Even yep. if they're, you know, even if they're not super artsy poetic, they're just and they're straight to the point. They're just like as a listener, I was like, I can really understand what they're talking about in this song. And my songs are all pretty weird and I need to start figuring out how to do that more <laughs> that, you know. But I mean, you know, and you're talking about like leveling up to uh if you're not pushing yourself to work with somebody who is is 
their goal is a quality that feels greater than what you're comfortable with, right? Then you're not you're not pushing yourself. Sometimes hearing that it sounds a little bit it sounds a little bit woo woo when we talk about this stuff, but it's really the the bottom line is it's very simple. It's like if you don't push yourself to the limit, you're not going to get better enough to be able to do that limit. Like if you were trying to jump the high jump and you're on the track team, yeah, you got to keep jumping and knocking the bar off until you get good enough to jump over the bar, right? It's that That's right. simple. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just a foundational objective truth about life where you're, you're not going to grow unless there's something uncomfortable. Like we don't grow when we're in a great season of life. We just enjoy that. We tend to like humans just tend to like soak it up, enjoy it. That's, that's awesome. But the, but if you really think about the times where you grew in something, it's when you were kind of pushed out of your comfort zone. Yeah. And whether that's relationships or money or stuff or, you know, your job or whatever, like for, for me, I, I play a lot of basketball. I'm really, really into the NBA and playing basketball, pickup games and leagues and stuff like that. And it's a great way for me to stay healthy, but it's also a really awesome way for me to get some adrenaline and energy out. And when I was first kind of, you know, starting to play ball competitively, uh, I learned the same lesson in basketball. Like the games where I felt like I grew in a skill set or a, a, a mentality or way of thinking are games where I probably sc- I screwed something up. And I would go home and I would just, you know, obsess over that detail. And, you know, we lost this game because I did this or this guy did that or whatever. And then the next game, I wouldn't make that mistake or I would make it way fewer times or whatever. And it's just as a microcosm of life, it was just a really helpful way for me to kind of learn that same lesson. I think the studio and recording and music is the same way, you know. Do Do you sometimes tell yourself, basketball is my favorite sport. I like to take the ball up and down the court. Yeah, <laughs> it's so I love basketball montages in, in movies. Yeah, they bring me joy. So, so um, we were introduced by Jim Stewart, mm. and you guys have been part of a mastermind group for a number of years with, right. I believe, with some other guests on the show, Lee Turner, Michael Estock, Stuart Richardson. Great, great people. Uh, again, what is a mastermind group? Why should we know about something like this? Do you want to encourage the rock stars to never, ever do anything like that or to hurry up and get their own thing going? Definitely the latter. Hurry up and get your own thing going. Uh, I So I kind of stumbled into it a little bit because I heard Jim on another podcast. I believe it was the Six Figure Home Studio podcast a few years ago, which some, some of y'all might know about, but... Um, I think it I yeah, I think it was a few years ago I heard him I uh, realized that he was a couple hours away from me in Cleveland and somehow connected over Instagram hey man I heard your podcast I really enjoyed listening to you talk about whatever it was you know I, I don't That's remember awesome. the topic but I just kind of hit him up uh, as I'm prone to do on Instagram and just say like hey man really appreciate your insights into I think it, he was talking about automation and kind of keeping your business like running slick and I mean, Jim is side note, he's just a master at that. So I just really appreciate some of his thoughts. So I think I hit him up and we got to chatting, got to be friends, like kind of over the internet, (laughs) internet friends or whatever. And then uh, he said, Hey man, you know, I think you would really fit into this group. We're kind of, we had this thing called a mastermind group and we started it because of this podcast that he was on. And, you know, like you said, Michael and Lee and some of those guys were already in that group. So I was one of the last guys to jump in, but that group has been absolutely transformative for me. Absolutely transformative in so many different ways. And I was trying to think of how to even summarize this on a podcast, like what what it is. And I guess I could just give a kind of a high level. But really, so we we meet once a week on Zoom. We all hang out for about an hour. And we just talk about whatever we want to talk about. There is no predetermined agenda and what that does is it allows us to just talk about if somebody is going through something, whether it's in the studio or even outside of the studio, we can just all focus on that one thing and just all kind of give our thoughts and encourage that person and really just rally around somebody. Sometimes it's just a topic where like, hey, man, like I was at AES and I went to this seminar and this guy said this crazy thing. What do you guys think about that? We're like, oh, that's crap or what you know that's that's a great idea and we'll just kind of debate for an hour and just kind of talk about stuff sometimes it's gear related which isn't that often because all of us i feel like are (laughs) we're at a point in our career where like the 
sometimes gear is cool to talk about. And sometimes it's like, ah, we've been looking at YouTube gear reviews all day anyway. I don't want to talk right. about it. You know, right. so, so yeah, sometimes it's about that or plugins or whatever. But a lot of times it's just adjacent to what we do for work. You know, there's mastering specific guys in that group. So sometimes we'll all gang up on that guy and be like, what do you do? Like, what is your process? And how do we as producers and mixers give you better stuff? And then you walk away with this like unbelievable list of things to do when you're mixing that you know specifically mastering engineers are looking for. And it's like, dang, that is so helpful. Or like, you know, sometimes we'll all gang up on Jim and we'll be like, dude, your mixes are so great. Like, how are you doing this one thing? Or like, you know, me as a producer, I I tend to mix a lot of things I work on, but I've sent stuff to Jim to mix. And so sometimes I'll pick his brain on the mastermind call and be like, hey, what'd you do there? Or like, you know, this or that or you know, everybody has like such a specific skill set in the mastermind group that actually weirdly enough doesn't overlap that much with everybody else. Like everybody kind of has their lane. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it works so well is sometimes it's really fun to talk to somebody about what you do, but I really enjoy talking to people like a mastering engineer where I don't really do a lot of mastering. I really want to know because mastering affects my job tremendously. Like that's the song that I produced. I'm hearing it back. Like, what am I hearing? And, you know, so... So that that's kind of the nitty gritty of what we talk about. But really, the more important part of what it is, is it's just a community that we work so often by ourselves in the studio. A lot of days we're editing, we're just working by ourselves. And for those of us like me that are extroverted, that love being around people, it's just this shot in the arm every week of, okay, the guys are going to be on it you know, so-and-so time on Wednesdays, like I need to be there because I need to show my face. And like, yeah. I'm stoked to talk about whatever we're talking about. Or I sometimes I'll, I'll predetermine like, man, I really am struggling with how to price for this weird project that's coming. I'm going to talk to the guys and, you know. Empirical Labs, creators of the iconic Distressor, offer high-performance gear for audio professionals. The Fatso, or Full Analog Tape Simulator and Optimizer, brings the warmth of vintage tape and tube electronics to your digital recordings. Perfect for mixes, masters, or overdubs by adding harmonic generation, high-frequency saturation, tape emulation, and compression. The impressive new Pump, a 500-series classic knee compressor, shares its DNA with the analog distressor and arouser plugin. It features eight selectable compression ratios, precise attack and release controls, saturation, a high pass filter, and a first time ever attack mod for added transient control, which is ideal for adding more snap to your snare drum. All Empirical Labs products are hand assembled and tested right down to the circuit boards in northern New Jersey, USA for durability and performance design to last and be easily updated. Go to EmpiricalLabs.com to find the Arouser and Big Freak plugins where you can use the coupon code RSR10 for 10% off. Remember to follow at Empirical Labs on Instagram, making studio gear that works a little easier, a little better, and a lot longer. Elevate your music production with the updated Complete 15 bundle from Native Instruments. Featuring the new Contact 8, this comprehensive collection includes a fantastic range of versatile synths, sampled instruments, and innovative studio effects, giving you everything you need to bring your creative vision to life. Whether you're composing emotional scores, crafting deep dance floor grooves, or experimenting with unique sound design, Complete 15 has got you covered. Discover powerful plugins and instruments that guide you from the initial idea to the final mix. The included Contact 8 introduces exciting new tools like chords and phrases for instant inspiration, the Leap tool for dynamic looping, and Conflux, a cutting edge hybrid instrument that merges Merges organic and synth sounds in real time. Plus, enjoy revamped versions of Massive X and Guitar Rig 7 Pro to take your sound even further. Then polish off your mixes with the AI-enhanced Isotope Ozone 11, included in the Complete 15 bundle. Use the code ROCK10 for 10% off at nativeinstruments.com.
it's awesome to hear you talking about this. And, and of course, I have a mastermind group as well. Um, and we, I started it. Uh, believe it or not, this is my fourth podcast. So I had already done three. Um, and wow, <laughs> on a previous one, I had been invited in, I was actually invited by somebody locally to join a mastermind group. We did that for a while. We were meeting in person. And then I don't think we ever switched to online. We actually switched to once a month in a, a shared workspace and decided to do a full day. And that was cool. And that lasted for a while. And then later I started it up with some other guys um, and it was called an accountability group mm. because I had joined a membership about podcasting. So it was other podcasters. And then when I started this, I absolutely knew what I wanted to do, which was like, yeah. I'm starting this. It's going to be part of it. I'm inviting people in as I wanted to do that. And yep. now we've got a core group. So I appreciate the the power of mastermind groups. And it's just a fancy name for being very, very intentional and meeting with people on a regular basis that are, um, you know, peers yep. that might not be doing exactly the same thing you're doing, but you have like sort of a shared common interest of some sort. So in your case, so therefore I've got lots of questions for you. <laughs> yeah. So. So Jeremy, like, did you guys find that a certain size of the group was the appropriate size for doing it? Have you found that um, some things t tend to break it and you have to come back to mm. making it work better? Um, and then, yeah, the other question would be, have you, have you arrived at a format for the call? Like how long is the call and, and it, does a particular format work? Yeah. So the things that work really well for us is the calls are anywhere from an hour to an hour 15. Um, cause they're, they're usually, you know, it's not on a weekend cause that's typically kind of family time for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, you know, during a work day and unless you have a session, I think everybody is, uh, makes a pretty concerted effort to be on every call. And so the continuity of the same people being on the same call every week really helps further you wanting to be on the call every week and not being yeah. the guy that is scattershot and kind of there once a month or whatever. So so the consistency is really important. But I, I would also say it's just so fun to be on a call with these guys that I don't want to miss it. And I think everyone else feels that way, where if I have to miss it for a couple of weeks in a row, like I try to... I try to not schedule sessions really during, you know, we do ours Wednesday morning. So I, I really try to have sessions not be at this exact hour of the day. Cause a lot of times like, you know, you're scheduling sessions a little bit out, you can kind of, you know, work with people on their schedule and all of that. So I think all of us, I would imagine the other guys are, you know, to some degree similar where as long as they can make it work, you know, you, you obviously don't want to turn down work if it's the only time they can, you know, yada, yada, but yeah. Um, a reasonable effort to just make that time, you know, it's just like anything else in life. You you get out of it what you put into it. And so all of us putting in the time, we've been doing it every week now. I've been a part of it for two or three years. And a lot of these guys have been doing it for several years before that. So yeah, I've done just, this one that I started is 10 years running now. Yeah. See that, that I want to get to where you are with that. Like I want to have a decade plus with these guys of just you know, some of them I haven't even met in person, which is kind of crazy. We're we're changing that this year. Thankfully, we're all going to kind of fly into a place and drive to you know and, and hang out together, which is that's really great. I experienced that as well. The funny part, you'll have to report back about how shocked you were when you when you finally meet somebody face to face after you know Zoom calls. Um, of course, for us, it wasn't even Zoom calls. Zoom arrived in the middle of my mastermind. You know, it didn't even, people didn't even it didn't even exist when I started. Oh, interesting, interesting. But the um, but you you meet one of the guys and you're like, um, or girls and you're like, uh, you're like, I had no idea you were that tall. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You you just see the like computer version of them, or you just hear their voice, and yeah, yeah. It's, it's always trippy to meet in person. So when I started mine, I was training for a barefoot marathon at the same time. Um, and so I had laid out a whole four month schedule in my calendar for what day, what mornings I would have to run. Right. So therefore 
Friday mornings were the morning off for me. And I was like, it's going to be Friday, you know, 8 a.m. <laughs> and uh, and then I just yeah. picked that time and then invited people to do it. And, and what I found is the people who really wanted to be in there and were a great addition, they really wanted to be in there, you know. So, so some of the guys, they actually get up at like 6. They're on the call because they're on the Pacific Coast. Um, you know, one of the guys is in England. And so he's like, you know, making a sandwich at the end of the day. (laughs) Um, so it's a real variety, but that's the power of doing something like that online too, is you can have a mastermind call with people from all over. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, the power, yeah. The power of our group to some degree is because guys are all over, you know, there's guys in New York and, you know, a lot of us are kind of in the Midwest area. There's several guys in Cleveland and, um, stuff, but they're, yeah, there's kind of spread all over Nashville, Lee's in Nashville, kind of probably semi close to where you are. And, mm-hmm. and so, yeah, there, there's just, there's perspectives you get with a mastermind group. That's not just based in your city that I think is really valuable too. You can hear about different markets and just kind of like those people are going to meet people that you've never met because you don't live in that city. But if you're all in the same city, there's, there's a, also a synergy to that, but you're also probably all kind of in the same spaces and people and all that. So there's really benefits to both ways. I would say either way though, for the anybody listening, like whether it's people in your city or whether it's other people, like just get on a call once or once or uh, you know every week or every other week and just start hashing out life together with people. It's it's just more fun. So let's talk about format. Have you yeah. arrived? Well actually talk about size of the group too. Do you guys yeah. uh, do you have any insights into um, are there, any, you know, is there an ideal size of the number of people yeah. that join a call? Yeah, it ebbs and flows over over the months, I would say, for how large or small. But it, it typically is anywhere from a minimum of four or five on a call up to um, eight or nine, I would say, yeah. is probably the... If you get more than that, I would say um, it tends to be tough to get everybody involved, just human nature, I think start, you, people start deferring more and there's maybe not quite as much like round table as much as you, you can get when you have a, a little bit of a smaller group. So I would say if it's less than, you know, four, it's, it's maybe tricky to get a lot of different kind of insights and opinions, but if you have I, a lot more than eight or nine, it's, it, yeah, it's tough. So. Yeah, I agree with you. I have actually tried to do one-on-one mastermind. Um, and we did that for a little while, but it, it didn't, quite work. It's really, it's really is a, I think a great insight that four to eight is kind of the ideal sweet spot. Yeah. It's perfect. Yep. You know, when you think about it, it's like, duh, that's about the size of a dining room table. It's the size <laughs> of a lot of families. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. All right. Groovy. So four to eight people is a great, uh, guideline for, for a mastermind group. Yeah. Um, what about format and topic and like, is there a, do you have a structure to it or do you find that no structure is the way to go? In our particular case, we have found that no structure really works well. Um, we are all, I would say, you know, thirties, maybe early forties been doing this for a while. So we don't, it, it wouldn't be particularly helpful, I think, for our specific personalities in our group to have like a very strict topic. Um, it's typically a lot of times the first few guys that hop on, they'll start talking about something. And then as people log in, that we'll all kind of chime in because, you know, again, I don't know if it's just the personalities in our group or if this is just how masterminds tend to work because this is really the first like long-term one I've been in. But you just end up talking about stuff that's interesting to everybody. You know, if everyone's invested, there's very rarely like dead time or, you know, weird tan- tangential stuff, which occasionally happens, but then we'll laugh about it and move on kind of a thing. But there, there's just enough going on in everyone's life to where whatever's top of mind tends to come out, you know? Yeah. So, well, yeah. I think it's good. And, and again, I think it depends on the group of people that you find yourself with too. Uh, right. Everybody's, you know, these are real people, real personalities. So it's always going to be different from everybody, for everybody. Um, and it's interesting to discuss this with you too, because so in, in my situation, you know, our group spanned some generations. So when, when I started it, it was like, you know, uh, mid to late twenties was the, the youngest. And at the top end of that was, you know, uh, 50, um, you know, a little over 50 or whatever. 
Actually, not quite 50 at that point. Right. Um, so we we span whatever that is, uh, 20 years or something like that, 30 years. years. Yeah. And so you got different perspectives on it. On it. Um, and we certainly talk about business stuff. We talk about uh, family stuff. A little bit about the, the music making stuff. So that that is our theme, too. I wanted it to be people who are who think making a record is the greatest thing, you know? Absolutely. And, and so it's definitely music interested people, but we also found that, um, too much structure didn't work. Mm. We tried doing too much structure, but, uh, no structure didn't work for us either. Mm. So then we arrived at this very simple one called uh, happy crappy where everybody gets a five minute timer and you just list the stuff that's like great, great for you this past week and the stuff that sucked. And then um, maybe yeah. there's a little bit of feedback afterwards. And with, our, you know, with a group of five to six, a little bit of saying hello for 10 minutes at the beginning and then going around the happy crappies. And then people, you know, a, a group of the people on the call have to get off because they have to get their kids to school in the morning. Mm. And that, so that tends to be the timing of it. So it's interesting to hear you talk about yours too. And there's just, there's different levels of what's going to work for everybody. Yeah, but I, you know, I will, I will um, continue that as a a thought I've had before. Um, I never started one just for my studio, but I think that would be incredibly powerful. And maybe you feel like this is for your studio, so it is. You can be the one to talk about this. Mm -hmm. But I always thought it would be incredibly powerful for those who just wanted to make records, do the studio thing, the production, be able to have um, camaraderie and and uh, peer group. Um, con contemporaries around uh, the business side of doing it, and and right. not just you know fading into obscurity for hundred you know five dollar projects or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um. So so do you feel like that has been sort of a goal for you guys? Is the music making, the production, all that? Yeah, I would say for sure. We, I think we're all we're all pretty. Um, interested like all of us have this personality where we're pretty interested in what everyone else is doing and so because naturally we all gravitated towards each other at this mastermind group because of music you know most of us i would say play music or have done something like that you know in the past there's just this kind of shared um vocabulary or dynamic that all of us tend to have where we recognize it in each other like oh yeah i did that years ago or like this or that and so it's a really, you know, and all of us are just nerds, like every one of us, you know, front to back nerds so love talking about dumb stuff, you know, with plugins or just like techniques or like all of us, whether or not we're all actively producing or recording or whatever at any given time, all of us have done all of those things. And so it's just more fun when you get to like talk about some crazy video you saw or something you tried yesterday that didn't work and you get to just blech onto the group and be like, this was crazy. What do you guys think about that? And everyone's like, oh man, you should have known this was going to be, <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. There's just this, yeah, I think camaraderie, like you said, is the perfect word for it. Like, that, I think if, I, yeah, I think if my group, I think if the rest of my group were, you know, dentists and <laughs> I don't know what other profession, you know, like arms yeah. dealers, I would have, I would struggle to know what to talk about. You know, we'd be talking about different videos we saw. So I, 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 I agree with you. I think it helps to selectively choose people that you feel like are going to be a good addition to your group. And yeah. I, you know, it sort of reminds me too, it's a little bit like starting a band, you know, without the, um, the van full of gear getting stolen after the gig in some strange town. <laughs> Been there. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, you know, this, I, I would encourage you rock stars, if you feel like you're the, uh, the band starter type, then start a mastermind group and just start inviting people to it. That worked for me. Um, if you feel like you're the band joiner type, uh, not that that's your type, Jeremy, but but maybe more of the process that worked for you right. is uh, maybe start searching around and meeting people that might be doing something like that and find one to join. It kind of doesn't really matter how you get there. It does not. That's exactly what I was going to say. It doesn't matter how you find yourself in a group, but just find yourself in a group. And yeah. I, I didn't even know that this was a thing. This is just something that just never was on my radar. It didn't, I mean, you know. 
I knew that people, I'm sure, did this kind of thing just conceptually, but I just I didn't know that it was as easy as connecting with somebody and then getting asked to be, you know, it was just very seamless for me. And I think it could be that for anybody, honestly. Whether yeah. that person, like you said, is the starter or just the joiner, it doesn't really matter. Are you sick of searching for the right cable only to realize it doesn't even exist? Or maybe you're asking yourself, how in the world do I hook my studio up? Well, say goodbye to those headaches because Trace Audio can get you wired up right. Based in Nashville, but serving studios nationwide and around the world, Trace Audio specializes in custom cables, labels, and wiring solutions. From labeling your patch bay to wiring your full studio or large format console, Trace Audio does does it all, whether you're a home or pro studio owner. And the real game changer is Trace Audio's custom patch bay label designer. It's a one-stop tool to color code, organize, and design labels for your quarter inch or XLR patch bays. No more wondering where things are on your patch bay, when instead you can have sleek, professional labels that are easy to read and easy to use. Try the free online patch bay label designer at traceaudio.com and use the code RSR15 to get 15% off your custom labels and take your studio to the next level. Did you know that one of the most common fears with audio mastering is not knowing if your mix is ready or not? Look, nobody wants to send a mix in for mastering only to realize there's some resonating low end that's going on that wasn't picked up in the mix. That's where I come in. Hi, I'm Brian Murphy of Sound Porter Mastering. As soon as you send a mix for me to listen to, I'm already on your team. Mix feedback and master readiness is a service I offer for free and for good reason. That's because a great mix produces an even greater master. So if I can help you minimize oddities and issues and even provide some advice that will help your mix translate better, then mastering becomes more efficient and effective. And you don't stress about those issues at all. Just go to soundporter.com. There you can find videos, a fact, and a pre-mastering checklist on my website that will explain a lot of what you need to know. When you're ready for great feedback, just reach out via my low friction contact form and send me a mix to here. Again, you can find me at soundporter.com. Yeah, I was invited by somebody who said he was starting one up. So that was great because I'd never heard of it. Rockstars, you have a head start because you're hearing about it on this podcast. So now you know it exists. Now you know you can make it up. Um, The value of the group, you talked about ebbs and flows. So I wanted to make a comment on that. It's really exciting at the beginning when you're gung ho too. And there's, there's a, it's inevitable. It's almost like starting a band, you know, it, there may be an initial, like, um, you know, you are falling in love with the whole process where you're just so excited every time I, I certainly was, and I had so much to learn, but inevitably, um, in, creative worlds, in business, uh, in family, in all aspects of life, you're going to go past the, the um, you know, um, the I'm in love stage to, to like the, the ebb, like the low point of like, I don't know, maybe this isn't working. I might suck at this, all that kind of stuff. Exactly. And in my experience, that's where the regular meeting of the mastermind group is just as valuable as the times you know, on the sometimes you meet and you learn a new tip and a new strategy and you learn how to do something. You're like, oh my God, that's so amazing. I can't wait to go do it. Mm-hmm. Other times you show up and you have and and your take is I have nothing to offer. I didn't do shit this week. I feel like a failure. Nothing's mm-hmm. working. I don't even know if I want to still do this. And and I found it valuable, even probably even more valuable then, because it was just meeting with the group, hearing other people do stuff being reminded every week that this is still a thing. It's still like the opportunity to do what I want with music, with the podcast, um, with business. It's still waiting for me. It's still out there. You know, Absolutely. all I got to do is just be ready for it. Do you find that that's a similar experience for you guys? A hundred and ten percent. Like there are so many times where somebody will open up about a struggle they've had, whether it's like, man, I just haven't had the, the consistency of work that I've wanted and it's just really getting me down or whatever just for an example. And someone else will chime up, oh yeah, that was me a month ago. And then we'll be like, what? why didn't you talk about that then? You know, it's like, oh, I just didn't, I didn't want to talk, you know, I didn't want to 
bring that up and what, you know, so it, it's funny how when you open up about stuff, and I think this is true just in life, when you open up about stuff and you're vulnerable, and I, I am like the chief of sinners with this. Like I, it's tough for me to be vulnerable about things that I feel like I'm not doing a good job of. Cause I, I, I want to project like, yeah, I do a great job at everything all the time. hundred percent. Never, ever mess up, you know, never miss a three point, never miss a three pointer. No, I've, I've never missed a shot ever, you know, but, uh, the reality is that they couldn't be further from the truth. And when I open up about that stuff, it's unbelievable. Just the corners of other people's lives coming into the light where it's like, yeah, I did that a year ago. That was crazy. And then all of a sudden you feel not so bad <laughs> about the situation you're in. You might still struggle with it, but it, at least you realize like, Hey man, it's just, it's not just me. Like this is a tough, this is a tough thing to do to make money and to be consistently happy doing. And I think like any job, there's just seasons of joy and there's seasons of real you're in the ditch, just digging and you hit a rock and you're like, should I even keep digging? Like, I, I don't even know what I'm doing, you know? And that's like you just said, like that is really where the mastermind comes in to encourage you. And yeah. Yeah, that's great. And it's one of the things that I always thought um, made the most sense. I, I'm not, haven't been a regular churchgoer, but I've, but I've certainly been to church and I've, it's certainly been a part of my experience in life. And one of the things that I always appreciated about it was that very same thing. It's like, it's just that meeting up every week, even when you don't know what it's, what it's about or why you're going, or, you know, you don't feel like everything's, um, right as roses in your life <laughs> that, uh, that just keeps you in touch with, you know, the important stuff. That's and I think a mastermind really yeah. does that for business as well. Uh, absolutely. Yep. Or for creative works, you know, whatever. That's the other part about it. I think that, we tend to talk about it on in places like this because we arrived at it for the business aspect of things because we're like motivated to want to kick some ass or whatever, you know, we're like, yeah, I need to level up, but so it could be so anything. It could just be the creative stuff, you know, got yeah. a buddy who does a song circle in St. Louis. And I think it'd have the same effect, you know, getting people together to just present new s songs with their acoustic guitar, you know, mm -hmm. do it on a regular basis. Let me, let me pivot to this with you, Jeremy. Um, cause we're, we're coming up on the end of this, but I want to hit you with a few of the, uh, jam session questions as well. Yeah. Um, and this one is just through the mastermind, uh, through stuff you've learned about the business side of things. Are there any, um, tools, online tools or resources that you've, that you're excited about that you want to share with the rock stars, um, that might be helpful stuff you've learned? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I have, I've definitely been down the mix with the masters road and, uh, things like that. I've really gotten a lot out of, um, <laughs> my current, I'll tell you my current kind of weird, like thing I've, I've really just enjoyed diving into. Um, there's a producer, Eric Valentine. I think a lot of people Eric's awesome. him or yeah, you know, I'm maybe you've met him. I've never actually personally met him. I'd love to. I, I did have a chance to work with him for oh, that's awesome. for a long weekend, many, many yeah. years ago. Jealous. <laughs> but uh he's yeah, this this is this will be on YouTube for future generations, hopefully. But he's he's really he's building a new studio out in Vermont and stuff. And he he has really taken it upon himself to like uncover every tiny aspect of the business side of working in music, the acoustic side of building stuff, just the the practical stuff that high end people have always kind of like they've they've never really opened up this much about it. But like he's worked on some of my favorite songs ever, and so to hear him talk about stuff like he just has this kind of way of communicating, I think it's just phenomenal. And so I, I just have really appreciated his openness and um, his YouTube channel. I think it's called Making Records with Eric Valentine. Highly yeah. recommended. I every time I send it to a friend, they're like, "How did I not know about this thing?" You know. So I I've just really enjoyed that. Um, and yeah, then, he he yeah. builds amazing gear for the studio too, and he's always oh, been. Man. Yeah, undertone. he's just been like our our wild ad musical recording adventurer out there reporting back. You know, yes, yes. I made a thing called the Drumbrella, and here's what it does. And then everybody <laughs> wants a Drumbrella in their studio. Uh, I've been down that road. Oh, yes. Um, all right. So uh, when you started out in recording, what do you think was holding you back? I mean, you did mention the family not being into the 
you know, music in the same way that you were. So you had to like forge new paths, but anything else that was sort of holding you back? Yeah, I think um, the note that I wrote down, which we sort of touched on a little bit is, you know, I was thinking about this question ahead of this call, like what what would have held me back? I think the the thing that really just kept coming to mind that I couldn't get shake was just this idea that I didn't really know what it was. So it was hard to get excited about it when I first, and then it, it, for me, I was one of those situations where it was like a, a, a lightning bolt hit me when I, when I finally realized what you could do as a career in making music. Specifically, when I was touring in that band, Wolves at the Gate, when we first made our, our first like record label album, we went to the studio in Virginia. This guy built a beautiful studio and we worked there for a, a, a month or two. Once I saw that studio, I literally set foot in that studio for the first day. And I immediately like called my girlfriend, now my wife. And I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Like, that's cool. I just, I just had this moment, you know, it, it sounds pretentious. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. You see all the gear you like, whatever, like, yeah, it's a kid in a candy store. I, I genuinely did know like, this is, I think this is actually probably what I'm going to do. You know, I just, I don't know how I'm going to get there. Cause this is crazy. Look at the studio. How would I ever get this? You know? And then, you know, bit by bit over a decade, you kind of figure stuff out like we've talked about, but, uh, yeah, that's similar for me. I, when I was yeah. in Hong Kong playing music after college and I was in a studio and I'd been in studios before, but for some mm -hmm. reason it hit me that one time and I looked around at all the lights and I was like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. I got to go back to the U S and find a whole new school and learn how to record music. And then I'll, then I can set out on my career. Then I can do it. Yeah. So uh, how about sharing some of the best advice you remember receiving or maybe an inspirational quote or uh, or somebody just really inspired you? Yeah, <clears throat> I wrote down a couple that I, I thought would be worth sharing. Um, and one of them, actually, I looked up, I think this guy's been on your show before, um, F. Reed Shippen. Yeah. I love that dude's work. Uh, never met him again, but I've just followed his stuff online for a while. He said in a, a podcast, and maybe this was on your podcast. I don't remember which podcast it was on. Maybe it was a YouTube video. But he was talking about um, how do you do, like basically how do you do excellent work consistently to, to mm -hmm. some, something like that. And he said this thing that I just think about all the time where he said, sort of paraphrasing, he said, doing what I think someone, what someone else wants is almost always going to be a losing battle. And I have to do what I think sounds good. And if I fail, at least I did the thing that I tried to do. And I think that that just lack of fear of failure was just really, it spoke to me when I heard that. Because I, oh, think, I, I think he's afraid of failure, just like I am, just like we all are. I think he, that's <laughs> yeah. what he was admitting to me too. Yeah, exactly. You know, at times. Yeah. No, but I mean, he's, that's the good takeaway too. It's not, it's not the lack of fear. It's the, it's as you said, it's the willingness to yeah. step right into it. Yeah, that, that's a better way to say it. Yeah. I mean, we all have that fear for sure. But I think just confronting that fear in that way is real was just really motivating. And I think I didn't do that for a long time. And I would kind of, I would back off of my opinion or I would be like, ah, I don't know. Da, 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 da. And then now I'm much more assertive simply because I'm much more confident in what I'm doing. And honestly, that quote really helped kind of clarify some thoughts I had at the time. So that, that was just a really powerful one. <laughs> For 15 years, I owned a famous MCI console that came from Criteria Studio C in Miami, where it made many Grammy-winning records in the 1970s, and it sounded amazing. When I was ready to upgrade my studio to full digital mixing, I decided to team up with Rick Carson at Make Believe Studio, Metric Halo, and Golden Ear producer Bill Simzik to recreate the legendary MCI console as the new new MBSI plugin. This isn't just another boring plugin. The MBSI captures that same iconic sound that was used on multi-million selling records like Hotel California for the Eagles, produced by Bill Simzik, Saturday Night Fever and Stayin' Alive for the Bee Gees, I Shot the Sheriff for Eric Clapton, We're an American Band for Grand Funk Railroad, and the soundtrack to Grease, and was loved by legendary producers like Tom 
Tom Dowd, Todd Rundgren, and Bill Simzik, to name just a few. The MBSI plugin not only delivers the authentic sound of the original MCI console faithfully, but it also adds new features like a top-notch compressor, overdrive, and a high and low-pass filter switch, features I always wished that the console had. Now you too can get that Grammy-winning MCI sound in your home studio, just like me. Whether you're recording or mixing, you can experience the sound of Miami 1976 with the MBSI plugin and soak up a little sunshine in your sound. Go to makebelievestudio.com slash MBSI. Are you recording your own music or other people's music in your studio, but you're having trouble figuring out how to get your mixes to sound great? Do they sound weak or distant or lack punch or clarity? Well, I've got a gift to help you take your mixes from sounding like basement demos to sounding a lot more like professional mixes. And it's my free course called Mix Master Bundle. This course will show you how to get pro sounding mixes from your home studio using free and stock plugins and Pro Tools. And the best part is that these mixing techniques will work for you in any DAW, whether you're in Logic, Cubase, PreSonus, Studio One, Reaper, or anything you're using. Are you ready to make your best record ever? Then go to MixMasterBundle.com to get started for free now, and you can use the clickable link in the show notes of this episode. All right, cool. Oh. Um, how about sharing another recording tip hack or secret sauce, something the rock stars could use on their very next session? So I have a few. Should I just like fire through these real quick? Fire through them, yeah. Okay. I've got a few. Some of them are like 30,000 foot. Some of them are very practical. Uh, have as much wired up in the studio at all times as you can. Uh, the amount of time it takes to set up stuff for me was extremely uh, not beneficial. And so eventually I just figured out I'm going to have everything plugged in all the time. So get what you need to get to make that happen. You're probably going to be more productive because of it. This is a, (laughs) this is a very nerdy one. This is something I learned recently. Uh, I think another producer friend of mine turned me on to this idea. When you're, when you're mixing or working on something and you have a limiter or a compressor on something toggle, if that, if that plugin has a true peak limiting option, Toggle that on and off and see which one sounds better because you'll probably be surprised at which one sounds better. For me, I, you know, I am definitely not the most scientific when it comes to like intersample peaks and just all of the stuff that goes on with limiters and compressors. I mean, I know, I know enough to be dangerous, but I, I, spoiler alert, I tend to leave it off and. I've I've noticed just kind of a clarity in some of the stuff I've worked on and talked to some other people. We we love to talk about this in Mastermind Group because I think everybody has different opinions and stuff. So yeah. it's it's been a fun thing to do. So those are a couple of things. Um, try one thing I love to do is just record guitar directly into a preamp and just don't use amps or a Kempers or anything. Just run mm-hmm. your pedal board into a preamp. You can get some really cool tones that way. And I've I've really been kind of experimenting more recently with that. And I've been very pleasantly surprised at just... Do you have a... um I, Ones that I've used at my old MCI console mm-hmm. would sound great if you just overdrove the preamp. And sometimes I'd take go out of one preamp into the next preamp and double them up, double them up and you'd get more drive. And 100%. it sounded awesome. But a, yeah. a Neve 1073 was a classic example, yep. learning that if you just went direct and you just plugged into that and then went kind of crazy with the EQ, you'd come up with these wild, wacky, fuzzy guitars. I think you need to have a pretty good preamp to do this to, for it to sound really good because I think the better ones tend to just clip better, like it just in a little bit more of a pleasing way. So I, I have a couple of 1073s and that's what I do is I just run into those and just, I literally turn it all the way up and just feed whatever level into that that I want. Have you, um, I, you know, everybody gets this message about, you know, don't overdrive your input of your DAW, you know, uh, don't don't go into the red and everything. But have you had a chance to work with anybody who's just like, screw that, I don't care, and they and just blast the input of your DAW or your interface and then just turn it down in the mix and that's the yeah. cool guitar sound? I, I I am the person that does that. I love, like, so I, I have a, a whole synth wall over here, like some Junos and some other stuff and all that's wired into a mixer. And I run those things so hot into the mixer that it's just, 
there there is no metering anymore. It's just red. Yeah. <laughs> then and then I I turn it. You know, I, I print it into Pro Tools. Sometimes I'll just turn it down on the way into Pro Tools, and so you get this crazy distortion, but it's at a reasonable level. Sometimes I'll I'll clip my converter just to just to hear what it sounds like. And sometimes I'm like, you know what? It does not have the same juice if I don't do that. So I'm going to just do it. And then you have a fader in Pro Tools. Like just turn it down. It's not that big a deal. You know, if it's really harsh, use a filter. It it doesn't it doesn't need to not clip to sound cool. And I have shed that idea, I think, recently. And some people do it better than I do, even. Like I'm I'm really kind of just starting to figure out how to do it well, but it's been really fun, you know. Well, I remember hearing from uh, Chris James many years ago that one of the secret weapons in mastering was to clip the inputs of converters back in the day of trying to get things loud, you know, before we had uh, a mazillion plugins. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's a, it's just a good reminder. That's sort of an original clipper. Um, how about a favorite yeah. hardware tool for the studio? Anything physical you love to have on a session? Especially yeah, well, now that you've minimized everything. Yeah, I have minimized a lot of stuff. The so a couple of things I use a ton in the studio are the Kemper I was talking about. But again, not just as a guitar processor, but using it as uh, an outboard mixing tool is really fun and really intuitive and um, kind of an underrated way to, to use it. So that, and then I, I've really gotten into modular synthesis, like Eurorack cool. kind of gear. Yeah. And you can run all kinds of stuff from your DAW into that and just get sounds that you just, I don't know how to get any other way. <laughs> That's all I know how to put it. It's just weird stuff that just makes some of your product. It can make your productions very, very unique to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, because just like guitar pedals, you know, we all buy pedals that are unique to us. Like we like this sound. We want to do it. Eurorack is the same way, modular synth, like where you can just, there are thousands of modules. And if you really do your research, you can find stuff that just speaks to you. Like there's 25 different distortion modules that sound radically different from each other, just like guitar pedals, you know? Mm -hmm. And so if you're a studio guy, I think not even just as a synthesis thing, but just as a processing thing, modular stuff can be just a, a fun rabbit hole. Yeah, stuff to think about rock stars. You've got, you, you can think about it like distortions to run through. You can think about it like filters to run through. They can have effects. Mm -hmm. You can get clever um, with stuff that will make the control voltage chase the pitch of a yeah. sound. And then you can generate a new synth sound underneath that follows along. So you're singing, but there's this weird synth following your voice. Yep. There's a lot of fun stuff you can do. Um, Jeremy, what do you have any tip for the for the rock stars about level in and out of getting out of your session into modular synth gear and then back into the session? Do we need to have a special converter box or anything like that? You don't need to, but it does make your life easier. So you can run out of so specific to Euro Rack, it runs way hotter than a guitar signal and unbalanced like guitar pedal signal or a guitar signal uh, or line level, it's way hotter than line level. So you're going to want to turn it way down when it goes into um, Euro Rack. Like the headroom is crazy high. But then coming out of Euro Rack, you have to pad it down like crazy. So they make these modules where it automatically converts it from a line level to a Euro Rack level and then vice versa. Okay. I just have this one module that does both of those things. So I just come out of that into the rack and then out of that back in. And is it usually a quarter inch cable going into it and out of it? Or is it like, do they make them with XLRs too? I guess it's just going to your patch bay or something, isn't it? It's, yeah, you can wire up to your patch bay, but Eurorack specifically uses eighth inch patch cables, like little like aux cord, yeah, <laughs> ones, yeah. you know? And so all of it, all of it has to be that. But then coming out of your Euro rack, they always, they make like XLR converters that you can just, yeah, patch right in. So, all right. Um, one more time, uh, how about an organizational tip, something you want to hit the rock stars to for keeping your shit together and organized in your studio or business? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had two thoughts on this one. Uh, the first one was I, a year or two ago, I bought a, sp a hard drive specifically just for my sounds and samples that, don't, that doesn't live on my studio computer. And for me, the reason I did that so everything is USB C now for me here in the studio. I have a Mac studio and stuff. And it's so it's it's is it's basically as if it was on the internal hard drive. It's so fast. There's really no latency or like it, it, you can just run sessions right off of that. So 
it's also really, really awesome to be able to grab that hard drive and go to other studios and just have your sounds with you, you know, at, at that studio. It's It's been really fun for me to just have it on a little, you know, uh, sand disc, I think. I just a little like $100 sand disc that's like two terabytes or something's crazy. Just mm-hmm. how cheap, you know, that stuff is now. So okay, that, cool. that's, that's one thing that I've really loved. Uh, as far as like a practical business thing, I use this software online called Wave Accounting. And that for me specifically has really transformed the way that I invoice people, the way that I keep track for taxes um, and things like that. It's been it's been really a godsend in terms of just keeping the back end, like not sexy stuff, like very in order so that there's no surprises in April or whatever. It's just kind of been a way because I've had those before where it's like, oh my gosh, whoa, I didn't I didn't do a good job this year like keeping track of stuff. So that that's been a really powerful way and it's it's a free software it's a free website they take like they don't really even take cuts of stuff unless you like they take a, a tiny fraction of every invoice or something like that but the it's not enough to really you know move the needle so it's it's really worth similar to like a quickbooks kind of thing but i i really love love wave so i remember pivoting my studio to online um invoicing and it was just a game changer Game changer. Game changer. I even made it, right. I even simplified it now where I use, so I use Calendly is mm-hmm. a scheduling software and that's how we book podcast interviews and it sort of makes sure that you got everything you need and the reminders and, you know, I, I won't, I won't miscalculate the time zone difference and screw it all up for us. So it's all automated. But, uh, but one day I was like, oh, I should just, could I use this for my studio too? And and I think my first struggle was like, oh, but it's, but that's, but I've got it in the podcast name and the studio is a different name. And then I was like, dude, that's stupid. Just use the same thing. Just do it. So, so now I've got a link and like for, for my preferred clients, I can just, I'm like, here's a scheduling link. I like, they don't even have to, they don't even have to check with me if they want to book a day of studio time with me. That's just, such a great I idea. I just handed it to them. I'll look at my calendar like, oh, dude, you booked a day next Thursday. Great. <laughs> then so you, it comes and, do you send that out to, to, you said you send it out to kind of like more of a preferred, like people you know? Yeah, I mean, I've got like yeah. one or two clients that use that right now, but um, just because I wanted to test it out and it works so amazingly. I couldn't believe how great it works. That, man, I'm going to have to think about that. That's a great idea. Yeah. I, uh, so, so just that being organized and simplifying your life with these online tools um, really can help with the studio leveling stuff up. Because a reminder to us, Rockstar, is the less time we spend stuck in back and forth messages and emails and yeah. phone calls and stuff like that, the more time we have to either, you know, spend it with our family or work on the other aspects of getting our studio dialed in or get that mix sounding great, you know, instead of doing all the clerical stuff. Yeah. So Jeremy, last question. This one is hypothetical and we're going to take the way back studio machine. I like to ask this of all my guests and you get to go back in time and find your younger self. Um, you're, a, you're a young man now, so don't go too far back. <laughs> but you, you're going to go back and find yourself and you say, listen, dude, I've come back in this time machine to give you this advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to become a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice do you feel like going back and giving yourself if you could? The one piece of advice I would give that everything kind of comes off of is just give of yourself generously to the people you're working with. Because out of that generosity gift, it's incredible what comes back from other people when, when you set the you set the pace of generosity just in terms of your ideas, your physical tools that you're offering the project, your your time, your investment. When you when you are generous, it is unbelievable what you can accomplish with with literally anybody, really. You know, people respond to that in just a visceral way. And and part of what I was saying earlier, just of like where I pretend I'm a part of someone's band, you know, that to me is the practical outworking of being generous with my time, is I want to. I want to invest deeply into what it means to create art with you as a person. And that takes generosity from my part, but then also it takes a reciprocal generosity from your part to like match that. And when you're matching that, it, man, it's like, it's, you're off to the races, you know? And so I think, I, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I just, I, 
I've learned that over the years and really wish I would have known that from day one, you know? I think a good takeaway and a lesson for me that took a minute to start figuring out too is when you instinctively want to be generous, sometimes the next lesson is learning how to really listen carefully to what Mm. the people you work with are trying to do or need or want so that you're giving the right thing. It's like you don't want to be, you don't want to be that the aunt who keeps giving you like the the fuzzy bunny outfit for Christmas that you don't want to wear like in the what was it in the Christmas story? He's kids yeah, gets the bunny story, outfit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, the bad sweater. You don't yeah. want to be the the bad sweater generosity. You want to yeah. be the, the cool sunglasses generosity. Absolutely. Yeah, because generosity takes an active contribution to a relationship. So like in what you said, listening, I mean, active listening is so powerful. Like yeah. passive listening is there's times to do that, but active listening and responding to what someone's saying is just, it's, it goes a long way in the studio for sure. I'm sorry. What did you say? Uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll say it again, actually. <laughs> no, <yeah>. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, dude, it's awesome. Awesome to meet you. Awesome to hang with you. Yeah, man. Um, so, so great of you to come and just share all this stuff and tell us your stories here on Recording Studio Rockstars. Um, tell us where can the Rockstars find you online if they are um, wanting to connect with you. Maybe they got questions about stuff. Maybe they're just ready to make a great record. Where should they reach out and find you? Learn more about you. Yeah, I have a website, jeremysteckle.com. Uh, my Instagram is jeremy underscore steckel. So if you punch that in pretty much anywhere. It'll, it'll pop up and then, um, call me, text me. I can, I can give my number too. <laughs> it's, I, I'm an open book and I, you know, would would answer those Instagram messages, rock stars. That's, that's yes. what he was trying to say earlier. Yes, absolutely. The yeah. DM, the DM give, message. Give me a DM slide in. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, and again, rock stars, it's S T E C K E L. Correct. Yep. So, uh, Jeremy, Thanks for joining us on the show, Rockstars. Thanks for listening. And dude, I, I look forward to uh, connecting with you probably up in Columbus next time I'm up there. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Would love to love to hang. Thanks so much for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, dude. It's a pleasure, man. Great to meet you. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com. Thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star. I'm Lid Shaw and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our awesome sponsors who help make this show possible. Isotope, Native Instruments, Atom Audio, Empirical Labs, Sound Porter Mastering, and Trace Audio. And remember to take advantage of our special coupon codes. At isotope.com and nativeinstruments.com, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase. At empiricallabs.com, use Use the code RSR10 for 10% off the Arouser and Big Freak plugins. And finally, use the code RSR15 to get 15% off your custom patch bay labels at traceaudio.com. If you enjoyed recording Studio Rockstars, please check out our sponsors using the links in our show notes because it's a great way to help support this show. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio, and they're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fans fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Streming, and Liz Hulitskaya. Thanks so much for listening, Rockstars. We'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.